All right, here we go. Today we have renowned astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks for having me. You can call me just Neil. Neil is fine. Okay. Uh-huh. Neil it is. Yo, big fan for a very long time. Congrats on all your success and the impact that you made in the science community, kind of really bridging, you know, different cultures together to really make everyone smarter. <laughs> Which is what I think you've accomplished. Well, I think it's it's easier when you got good material. Ah. And the yeah. universe always makes good material. Absolutely. Because everyone at some point in their lives has looked up. Mm-hmm. And that's a common thread that you can stitch through whatever it is I want to share and to whomever it is that has time to listen. <laughs> so I'm really just uh, – I see myself as a conduit mm. to the cosmos for just for all all those who want to learn a little more and just feel like they're part of the universe again. Conduit to the cosmos. Uh, that's a good business card right there. Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> Conduit to the Cosmos. It's got alliteration and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's got I a little it. both. I love it. Well, it's your first time here, so let's start in the very beginning. So you were born and raised in Manhattan. No, no. Uh, well, uh, born in Manhattan, but I was my residence was in the Bronx. In the Bronx, yeah. exactly. Okay, born in Manhattan, and you were raised in the Bronx. The Bronx, yeah. Okay, and... Uh, two-parent home, your dad was a sociologist? Yes, by training. Mm-hmm. Okay, he was also the Human Resource Commissioner. at Under Mayor Lindsay during the Civil Rights era, yes. Okay. Yes, the 1960s Civil mm-hmm. Rights era in New York City. And your mom was a gerontologist. Later, right, they had a pact when they got married that she would raise the kids mm-hmm. after high school, uh, and he would go on to college, when the kids were grown, she would then go back to school uh-huh. when we were empty nests, which indeed she did. Mm. Got her undergraduate degree and then master's in gerontology and then worked for the feds administering money from the uh, – what department is that? Uh, Health, and, uh, Health and Human Services uh, Department of the Government to uh, feed money to uh, nursing homes and other places that cared for the elderly. So my parents were very much engaged in the plight of the human condition. And I'm their astrophysicist son. <laughs> that was a little bit <laughs> – I wasn't – I was never unaware of that disconnect. However, the this daily exposure, I might even call it a baptism, into concern for the human condition never left me. So uh, however far I floated into the sky – I uh, my feet were anchored on earth. Well, your dad is black and your mom is Puerto Rican. Uh, they were just my parents, but okay, if we're going <laughs> yeah. to colorize the story. Uh, so he, he has uh, he has roots in uh, the British West Indies mm-hmm. and his dark skin. Uh, my mother has lighter skin and she has roots in Puerto Rico. Both of them were born in New York City. Mm-hmm. Do you guys speak Spanish at home at all? No, she... she was of an era where you tried to lose your native language as quickly as possible. Oh, really? She would later, yeah, because it would it would interfere with your access huh. to opportunity. Okay, uh, you're welcome to America. You know, back in the 1930s and 40s yeah. um, and 50s. So you later on, she would expose us to Puerto Rican culture and would work to bring much of the language back. So all of the salutations in our correspondence are. Spanish now. <laughs> so she's 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 back in. She's 94, still going, and she's back in. Okay, and you grew up in Castle Hill? My earliest memories are the Castle Hill housing projects okay. in the East Bronx. Okay. Uh, it's near the Whitestone Bridge. You can see the Whitestone Bridge from there. And those are my earliest memories. And then my father's income went above that. It was a middle-income housing project. And then we had to move. You're forced out, yeah. naturally. And so we moved to Riverdale. So my formative years were actually in Riverdale, New York, the, this section in the upper left corner of the Bronx. I always said I was from the Bronx, but people in Riverdale always said they're from Riverdale because <laughs> <laughs> it's a swankier part of the Bronx. Okay. If I can use swanky and Bronx in the same sentence. Well, what was the Bronx like in the 70s? Uh, well, it was very neighborhood dependent, but there were parts of the Bronx that were completely bombed out. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would look at pictures from the Second World War after some army had been through some town and you'd see rubble and, and garbage and yeah. things. And there are parts of the Bronx, South Bronx especially, 
that looked just like that. Mm -hmm. My part of the Bronx was not. It was very well maintained, had good services and the like. I still nonetheless went to public school. All the schools I went to were numbered, except high school. Um, you know, PS 36, PS 81, junior high school 141. Um, and then in high school, uh, I attended the Bronx High School of Science. I mean, you were 15 when hip hop was born in the Bronx. Do you remember hip hop being a thing in the 70s at all? Not when it was born, because that was kind of happening. South Bronx. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a culture rising. Mm -hmm. And my exposure to it was probably simultaneous with everyone else's when it hit the charts. And, uh, you know, Curtis Blow and yep. the Sugar Hill Gang. And I, so by then I'm in college and just sort of slowly weaning myself off of disco. And by then I'm in college and we lost our minds hearing that music. Oh my gosh. We couldn't get enough. We, we, at a party, they play it multiple times. And generally, you don't do that at a party because there's enough. There's enough portfolio yeah. that you can fill the multiple hours. We would go back to that. We memorized all the, the you know, all the lyrics. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can still recite it to this day, and it brings me back to the memory of the funk and the smell of the dance rooms <laughs> of college. <laughs> I'm Curtis Blow, and I want you to know that these are the breaks. breaks. Okay. Break it up, break it up, break it up. Right, right. And the hip, the hop, the hippie, the hippie, the hippie, the hippie. Okay. Oh, yeah, there was. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to high school, mm -hmm. and at 15, you start Those are taking, the most formative years of my life in high yeah. school, yes. And at 15, you started taking astronomy courses at the Hayden Planetarium. No, earlier than that. Earlier than that. Oh, yeah, when I was okay. 12. 12. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, uh, when I was in sixth grade, which in that era was in elementary school, um, a teacher noted that all my book reports had astronomy themes and that I had this energy in class that by most measures would just be considered disruptive. Huh. Okay, I passed notes and I, I wasn't purposely disruptive. It was just a, a bubbling of energy that, you know, what is a good student? A good student is someone who never disrupts the class obeys every command of the teacher, and that's considered a good student. And so by that measure, I was not a good student. And all my report card, I have them all, said, Neil needs to show, exercise more um, a discipline for his academics and less social involvement is in order. So there was this combination of, of uh, disapproval of my personality, basically. And so one of the teachers said, maybe he needs another project after school. So she showed me this, this ad for courses that were being taught at the Hayden Planetarium. These courses for adults, actually. And so, so I began basically when I was 12. And, uh, and I took classes through middle school. And last one was early high school. So about 15 was probably the last one that I took. Yeah. Okay. And was it at that point that you kind of fell in love with astronomy? No, no, no. Earlier. <laughs> Earlier. Okay. So when I was nine, all right, right, when I'm nine years old, a family trip to my local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium, and I was starstruck. Literally. Literally and figuratively starstruck. Uh, let me, it was so bad or so good that there I am, you know, in these big cozy chairs, which usually adults fall asleep in. If you put an adult in a big, cushy chair that leans back in the daytime and turn out the lights. They're all asleep, but the kids are all just paying attention. So we there was a family trip and I'm there and I'm looking at all these stars and I just don't believe it because I've seen the night sky from the Bronx. Mm. So it didn't match my life experience. I know how many night stars there are in the night sky. There's like eight or 10. Yeah. All right. So I thought it was a hoax at first, but it was a beautiful hoax. Yeah. Only later, traveling Western Pennsylvania, back to the Caribbean, and I pay attention to the actual sky. Later, I'd go to mountaintops. Um, to this day, to say how warped this is, to this day when I look up at the splendor of the night sky in an unobstructed place, I say to myself, 
That reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. Mm. <laughs> so that's it's 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 I guess art. It, it's reality imitating art. Well, yeah, I mean, it's because of light pollution, right? At the why, time, why especially. You can't, you can't see all the stars. I mean, I remember the first time I went to Egypt, and we were, like, in a taxi going kind of cross-country in Egypt, and we pulled over, and we looked up, and it was like, oh, my God. Like, I've never seen this many stars before. Right, three, three things contribute to that. So you're in desert, likely, right. if you're in Egypt. Yeah, so, in so there aren't any clouds. And even when there are no clouds, often there's a humidity level that'll still interfere. Low humidity, no clouds, which are two correlated facts. Yep. So you had that. Yep. And I bet it was a night when there wasn't a moon. I bet. Possibly, yeah. Okay. The moon is not always out all times at night. Yeah. So that combination, it struck you. It found you. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was amazing. Like I still remember that night to this day, whatever, 20-something years later. And you know something? Billions of people for thousands of years, that's the only sky they ever saw. <laughs> Yeah. There's no light Before pollution. Electricity and <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly, and and that's relatively recent. C cities weren't electrified more than 110 years ago or so. So just in the last century, have we lost track of the night sky? And when I was growing up, not only was there light pollution, but there's also air pollution. Yeah, I remember because apartment buildings would burn their own garbage, in, in the incinerator chute, and so the ash would ascend. In the hot air, um, you know, hot air rises, so it carries the ash with it. As the air cools upon exiting the smokestacks, the, the chimneys, the ash would then descend. So I'd walk to school and I'd have to hmm. brush the ash Dirt off your shoulders. from my shoulders. Yes, that's how old I am. Okay, so you graduate high school yes. in 76, and you Bicentennial, apply. Believe I'm sorry? Yes. Bicentennial. Bicentennial, exactly. They made a big deal of that. I, yeah. I didn't really care, but everybody else cared. The 200-year so. anniversary of, mm -hmm. of America. And I guess you apply to Cornell University. I applied to five colleges, including yeah. Cornell. Cornell was mm -hmm. one of them. Yes. And Carl Sagan got a hold of your application. Yes, mysteriously, but yes. And I can only conclude, or I, can, I infer, that because the application was so rich with reference to the universe. So I was in the astronomy club and I bought a, my telescope walking dogs, other people's dogs. And I did a whole bunch of stuff uh, from age 11 and 12 onward that I think they must have sent him that application. Hmm. And since I hadn't already said yes, they thought he might help me say yes by inviting me to campus. So that's exactly what he did. So uh, Carl Sagan, you know, he was a major figure, but he wasn't famous yet because he hadn't done Cosmos yet. Well, he, he wasn't famous for. as famous as he wasn't as famous as he would become. Yeah, but he was famous. He, he was al already famous. He had written best-selling books. Mm. He had been a guest many times on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. In fact, the the famous reference of him saying billions and billions, he never said that. You know who said that? Johnny Carson imitating him with a comb over wig. All right. So that was, uh, so he already had very significant public exposure before this. So I knew he was famous mm -hmm. and I got this letter from him. Yes. But you, you didn't end up going to Cornell. No, I didn't end up going to Cornell. You went to Harvard. Went to Harvard. Right. Okay. So now you're at Harvard. But don't you want to know why? <laughs> Why'd you go to Harvard? <laughs> Why'd you turn down Carl Sagan? <laughs> Don't you want to know why? Sort of beef or something? No. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm deciding what schools to go to. And at the time, I subscribed to Scientific American. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite parts of that magazine, by the way, at the time, all the articles are written by active research scientists. And there's a part called About the Authors. And for every author... There is where they grew up, what college they went to, where they got their master's, where they got their PhD, and where they were serving on the faculty. And so I collected my multiple years of Scientific Americans, found all the physics and astronomy articles, and then I made a spreadsheet by hand. <laughs> okay. 
a handmade spreadsheet of the colleges I was accepted to and how many degrees and faculty were either obtained at that institution or were they resident in such an institution. And I made this checklist. And Harvard was three or four times longer Hmm. than the next closest institution. And I said to myself, well, and I knew enough at the time, I'm 17, but I knew that if I go to an institution for one person, people change institutions. They can, he could be attracted somewhere else and then he's gone, but I went there for him. So where does that leave me? And so what I wanted was the greatest range of options that I could be immersed in. So even if my interests shifted, there'd still be some activity there serving that interest. So uh, at Harvard, I didn't know at the time, but I would later realize shortly thereafter, that the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, the government astrophysics arm, believe it or not, the United States has a government-based astrophysics arm, was co-located with the Harvard College Observatory. And the combination of those two is what fed this list primarily. So I went there for that reason and only that reason. I didn't care about the ivy or the traditions or the fame or the whatever. I went there because I wanted wanted the richest exposure to the universe that I could get. I mean, we're talking about 1976. Were there a lot of black students at Harvard at that time? Yeah, Harvard um, is about eight percent. I would say uh, it would it would slowly grow to about twelve percent uh, within ten years of that. Okay. But yeah, it was about eight percent, okay. and, and the the number in the country is about at the time was maybe ten or eleven percent the pop the fraction of the population. Yeah. So okay, so it was a reasonable amount of yeah yeah yeah. I wasn't yeah. alone in it. Got it. By the way, in my in my elementary school, I was one of two black kids. So uh, there was a lot of a lot of people coming up and touching my hair, trying to, oh, what kind of hair is that? Or what's that on your skin? Yeah. Interesting, like to be the very first black person a white person ever meets. That's an, it was an interesting yeah. fact that even as late as when that had happened in the history of civilization, that things like that would still happen. Well yeah, I mean I mean I I'm I'm forty nine. So I remember going to high school, and I remember you know one of my best friends. He's he's black and Russian, and I remember we used to have That's conversations. What was that? That's a drink. Yeah, a black, black Russian. Russian. <laughs> okay. There's a Just white like... Russian. I don't know about the black Russian. <laughs> right, but, but I, I, I remember there's a drink. Your friend was a drink. My You're coming out drink. now Still on is. your podcast. You had an alcohol problem. <laughs> Shout out to Mike, <laughs> <laughs> my best friend yep. was a black Russian. All right, you know I, I remember in the in the eighties. You know, and you're talking about a decade before that. It was sort of an interesting time. You know, I remember we had, you know, this black kid that went, you know, that was in AP classes with me named Thaddeus Norman III, a very studious African-American kid. But he was like the only one. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, he wore Argyle sweaters and everything else like that. He played he, the whole role, huh? He played the whole role. If you got Roman numerals in your name, you know, <laughs> exactly. there's some expectation. Sure. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I remember me and my friend, you know, we got into a conversation back then. He goes, look. As, as a white kid, you could be, you know, a jock, you could be a nerd, you could be a skater, you could be the hard rock guy. There's there's all these different things you could be. But for black kids, it's like you're either the sports guy or the cool guy. But, but you know what I mean? Or being the like a, yeah. you know, Or an entertainer. Right. You know what I'm saying? But being like a black nerd, a black studious blurred. guy. Blurred. Blurred. Is blurred. The, oh, that's blurred, the term? Black nerd. I've never yes. heard that before. I thought you got to come on. Get with the, blurred get with the was, was decades here. Even in the in the 80s was somewhat of a rarity and it was sort of a little weird and so forth. So so here you are a decade before that and you're telling me you're the only one or two black kids, people are touching your hair and all types of other microaggressions and so forth. Was it sort of weird going through that? So as a kid, because the hair touching was mostly elementary school, huh. it was just, keep in mind, my father was a civil rights person. Huh. Uh, now there are two kinds, dare I bin it into only two categories. One is the angry black man stereotype. Mm-hmm. So that's with the fist in the air, uh, you know, the the Black Panther iconography. And then there's the Martin Luther King, you know, love your neighbor, you know, Jesus, you know, 
philo- philosophically uh, um, New Testament, love your neighbor. So that, so my father was, these people don't know any better. These vicious racists that are screaming epithets or coming under the hoses from the, from the, the, the police sheriffs in the South, they don't know any better. They, and so anytime someone came to me and asked me questions, touched my hair, I viewed it as a act of diplomacy to talk them through it. Mm. And then that's one fewer people in the world who one day would take some act of violence or whatever out of fear, simply born of ignorance. So, yeah. Uh, so I don't count, by the way, the concept of microaggression didn't yet exist. Yeah. So for me, that was just life, yeah. right? And you need a place to put it so it doesn't bubble up inside you. But yeah, I had places to put it, to discard it, to re- rejuvenate my energy, to continue it. Now about the blurred, uh, my high school, the Bronx High School of Science counts eight Nobel laureates among wow. its graduates. Okay. Okay. That's as many as the total earned by the country of Spain. Okay. So, <laughs> so this, the legacy there is significant. Mm. Now, everyone spreads into the normal range of what you see happening in high school. You know, you have the jocks and you got the geeks and you, you know, and the beautiful people and the geek, you know, the clumsy people. This school had all of that. It was just all shifted to the sort of the, the, the smarter end of what's going on. So if you go to the jocks, no jock was the dumb jock. The jocks were like, yeah, how many digits of pi do you know? All right, let's, let's yeah. do a smackdown. And so, <laughs> so that culture did not reject my blurtitude, nice. if there's such a word. But I will add that being athletic was a significant goal of mine so that I can hang out in the street. Yes, it was the Riverdale streets, but nonetheless, in the basketball court at night, um, yes, I could run fast. I was like the second fastest guy in the block. Um, in a pickup game of 10, I would be chosen fourth. Okay. Not first, second, third, definitely not seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So that's so I'm above the average of what was available to a pickup game. I could slam dunk a basketball in ninth grade. So my hands were big enough and I had very good spring. Uh, so those street creds enabled me to hang in ways that would not have otherwise occur if I were just the, the blurred sitting on the, on the park bench reading my calculus book. So I was in two worlds. I would later realize that valuing athletics on the level that I did was likely more because that's what society expected of me mm. than out of any inherent desire to be good at sports. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, in 2023, the level of, of ignorance between races, you know, still exists. I mean, the 16-year-old just got shot by an 84-year-old man because he had knocked on the wrong door trying to pick up his siblings. You know what I'm saying? That's a throwback to the 60s. But yeah. there's an old man thinking, oh, this this black kid is trying to rob me. It's Let me shoot factor. him through the door. Yeah, it's, and, a, it, it's, yeah. a, it's a fear factor. Yeah. And my parents trained us, me, my brother, and my sister. Uh, this is how you interact with police. Mm. This is The person is probably more afraid of you than anything. So be aware of that in advance. So these are, these are it's the, the talk so that you don't prematurely die at the hands of a scared person be that scared person, another civilian or police. So, uh, yeah, I would say perversely that the, the deaths that we hear about today, the deaths of unarmed black men at the hands of other human beings, be they cops or otherwise, um, that's an improvement over the 60s. The improvement part is back then it would never even make the news. Yeah. And so the fact that that happens anywhere in the country 
that it makes news all over the country is, is, is it perverse in its own way, but it's still a real statistical measure that people care on a level that didn't previously exist. Yeah. When I grew up, there were seven homicides a day in New York City, 2,000 a year. And some fraction, of, sorry, seven people died a year, a, a, a day. And some of those would just be cops killing unarmed black kids, okay? That might make the news if there was some other extenuating circumstance to it. Otherwise, it just was water through the bridge. Yeah. So when George Floyd was murdered and there were protests and there's a shift, a gravitational shift in our culture because of that and others surrounding it, but that was, of course, the most visible and the most egregious, um, that's a good sign. That's a really good sign that we would react in that way to this single event when so many of those happened in the past. Go take a look at Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Not, yeah, Do the Right Thing. At the end, there's a scroll of unarmed black people killed by the police. A scroll. Hmm. Take a look. And it's, it just continues. And he said, oh, my gosh. What, what, what the fuck is going on here? And most people never heard of any of those names. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So by, ni by 1980, you graduate from Harvard yes. with a physics degree. Physics. And you go to the University of Texas at Austin. Yes. Why leave the Ivy League system at that point? Well, so you go to where, who takes you. I apply to grad. I applied to Harvard. They didn't take me really for, for graduate school. Okay. Right. Actually, they. There are two reasons why they might not take you. One of them, they just don't want you. Another one is it's actually better to go to a whole other institution where you have new faculty, yeah. new new research programs. So it's it's genetically healthier to diversify your exposure than to stay in one place for eight or 10 years, because that's what it would be, four years as an undergraduate, another five or six. Um, I was accepted at UT Austin, that they own their own observatory in West Texas, the McDonald Observatory, nothing to do with the burgers. Um, and uh, that's where I met my wife, who was getting her PhD in mathematical physics at, nice. at UT Austin, right. Okay, so you get your uh, master's in astronomy. Yes. Uh, at Austin, mm -hmm. and then by 88, you go to Columbia. Yeah, so I transferred graduate programs. Uh -huh. uh, things weren't working out uh, with my advisor. Uh, things, th that's the thing about graduate school relative to undergraduate. Undergraduate, there's a book, and there's an exam, and there's a syllabus, and you do all of that, and you get through. Graduate school, there's a whole other social dynamic that has to work in order for it to work at all. And and this is your uh, your committee, your advisor, and the like. And there was there were elements there where it was clear I wasn't fitting in. And so generally, if you don't fit in, you you do get the masters, but then you move on. You go you either leave the field as many people do when things don't work out. But I was deep in, and so I transferred graduate programs to Columbia University where I was warmly embraced and I finished my PhD there. Well, I guess this is around the same time. Something interesting happened in 1989. So you were speaking to someone uh, about what you're focused on. And when you said astrophysics, they said, the black community can't afford the luxury of someone with your intellect to spend it on that subject. Okay, let me... So let me clarify the timeline on that. That conversation took place in 1978. Oh, okay, my bad. Okay, no, no, no. But I see, I know where you la where you're landed there, and I'll tighten yeah. that up. So that happened while I was in college. Uh -huh. I was wrestling, and I was I was on the wrestling team as, as a first love of sport. By the way, uh, it's funny how others they'd see me play basketball. Oh, why don't you go play basketball? I said, No, I prefer to wrestle. No, but you should play. But again, it's the, what have you seen in your life? Yeah, I wrestled in high school too. Oh, you did? Okay. Oh yeah. It cool. actually saved my life at one point. Yeah, all right. Uh, <laughs> That's a different story. Yeah. Wrestling, it's, it's a thing. It's, it's a thing. It's a, it's, it's a thing. It's definitely a thing. Yeah. It's totally a thing. So 
uh, my a fellow wrestler of mine, two years ahead of me, but we're the same weight category. So we're rolling around all the time with each other. We're walking out of practice, out of the practice room, and that's when he hands me that line. He said, what are you majoring in again? Astrophysics. He said, the black community cannot afford the luxury of someone with your intellect becoming an astrophysicist. He was majoring in economics. And I think he became a Rhodes Scholar or something and would go um, research enterprise zones in the inner cities and all of this. And so that was a very heavy emotional burden he put on me, that one sentence. Because I knew, I knew intellectually he's correct, but emotionally it's not what I felt. Emotionally, I love the universe. I want to study the universe. Why would you feel intellectually that is correct? Because the black community still had a long way to go okay. in terms of advances in our culture, in our civilization, in our uh, – today, we would call it diversity, equity, and inclusion, phrases that didn't exist back then. But that's what we knew was necessary and not yet achieved. And if I could find some way, and I was socialized, so if I could find some way to do like what my father did and try to bring some sense of justice to the world. Um, but here I am, the astrophysicist. And so, so fast forward, so, so this is a burden. I'm feeling this all throughout graduate school, okay? Throughout the rest of college, and it's there. It's like this, this albatross weighing me down on my neck and, well, I haven't referenced the albatross in a, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, the albatross. But anyhow, this, this, bur this anvil around my neck, thinking about it. And it was not until 1989 that I climbed out of that hole. Right, and that was when you had an interview about yeah. a plasma burst from the sun on Fox. Yes, yes. That's before there was the official Fox News network it's just, it was Fox 5, local news, but it was Channel 5 in New York, which is Fox, right? It was Fox. Right. And they asked you about this plasma burst, which you answered because you're an astrophysicist. And you had a quote, you said, I'd never before in my life seen an interview with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. I came to that realization after I went home because the interview was pre-recorded. And I go back, I call everybody. Mom, dad says, I'm going to be on TV. Check it out. And I'm eating dinner and I'm watching the evening news. And there's this interview with the, the weatherman because that's the only person typically who knows any science in the cast, in the, in the newscast, among the newscasters. And so, so... He didn't ask me, well, how do black people feel about plasma <laughs> explosions on the sun? Right. Do, the, do, do the rays affect black people differently from white? None, none of that. There was no racial reference at all in that conversation. All he was after was my expertise. This happened while I was still in graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, wearing my one tie and my one jacket. And I realized if I'd never seen that before, what had I seen? It must be, if you have a black person on being interviewed, it's because they're an entertainer and you want to find out their next gig, or it's an athlete, you want to find out, or it's a preacher talking about inner city economic opportunity. The idea of a black person being an expert on something that had nothing to do with being black, I think was transitional in that era, over those years. Because afterwards I said, Surely it's some other black people were interviewed for expertise. And so let me focus on it now. Maybe I just missed it. I spent three years after that <laughs> monitoring and checking this out. Okay. And nope, none of them. Well, yeah, you said at that point, I realized that one of the last stereotypes that prevailed among people who carry stereotypes is that sort of black people are somehow dumb. Yeah. Dumber than white people for sure. Yeah. Because if you're a white person... You're not, you, you, you can't, back then especially, you can't grok the possibility that a black person is smarter than you in every way. It, you, you're not allowed to have that thought, given how you're trained and given what you're exposed to. Yeah. From, from way back, you had to step and fetch it in, as a character in TV shows mm -hmm. um, and other sort of slow, dim-witted black people portrayed in pop culture. 
Yeah. Right on through cartoons and the like. So, yeah, this was your I, – I realized this was the last Bastion. Yeah, Eddie Murphy kind of changed that. I, I remember uh, reading this old interview. He said that until he started doing movies like Beverly Hills Cop, the black guy was always the, where are we going, boss? You know, let me fumble behind the white guy, whereas Beverly Hills Cop was – the black guy was the star. He was the smartest guy in the room. The, the white people are all fumbling behind him. And it sort of changed the narrative in Hollywood in a way. But that was the 80s. Yeah, that was the 80s. But yeah. also, Richard Pryor was in several films that – a really brilliant actor, by the way, uh, under undervalued for his acting. Uh, he was in several films. And this is a point I will, I will make that will bring a nuance to what you just said. As you may know – Beverly Hills Cop was scripted just for a Detroit police officer and it didn't specify that he be black hmm. and that in fact Sylvester Stallone was considered for that role. <laughs> really? Yes. I had no they just idea. needed kind of a renegade kind okay. of not the not the prim and proper person. So Eddie Murphy gets the role. That's why except in one spot there is no reference to him being black. Anywhere in the script. Right. The, the, that was the, the Michael Jackson hotel. Get the track, the hotel. Right. Exactly. Oh, he makes the scene about how they treat black people and then they accommodate him. That was clearly a one off and it was not necessary to make the film happen. And they put it in there because he is anywhere and he likes doing that. Right. So that's an example. And in most of the Richard Pryor films, including consider um, Blue Collar. Very underrated film, oh my gosh, about Detroit and unions and power structures. Um, he's in roles that had nothing to do with being black. And the third Academy Award to go to a black actor after Hattie McDaniel mm -hmm. and, and Gone with the Wind and Sidney Portier in Lilies of the Field or Valley, but Lilies, <laughs> the Lilies movie. Mm -hmm. Um, that Lily's movie, again, except for one script reference, made no reference to him being black. He was simply a, a, an itinerant architect, all right, a, way were, uh, a wandering architect to help these nuns in whatever is their, the, the needs of their facility. There's one scene in a hardware store where they throw in a race reference. That's it. You take that out, he is just another actor in that role. Okay. The third one was Lou Gossett Jr. in Officer and a Gentleman. And there is no script reference to him being black. When there could have been, because this is evil drill instructor, you could have people uttering all kinds of racial epithets, but that never happened. Point is, the point is, the moment you say you're a black person, I want to cast you as a black person. I'm going to ask you black people questions. You have ghettofied the interaction. Mm. If, if, if I'm a black scientist to you, then I'm not actually a scientist to you. Yeah. You have- Asterisk by your name. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, you have constrained who and what I can be in your mind hmm. by even assigning that label. Yeah. I remember you did an interview recently where you talked about some of the, you know, the racist things that people said about black people and monkeys and so forth. But you said when you actually scientifically look at White people, you know, monkeys are hairy. White people are the hairiest people on earth. On earth. <laughs> yes. I am really hairy. Like, no, seriously. This I, is, I, don't, I, I don't shave. No, I shave all. I'm I, shaving. I right don't. Now. I, you know, I, I got I, hair on my back. Coming up the my, my up chest through is your, all hairy. The hair coming I got up. I hair the on my ears. Collar. Okay. <laughs> I so, got, you know. Th these uh, were highly overlooked similarities. Yeah, uh, the big ears. White people usually have big ears. Bigger ears around. Monkeys okay. have thin lips. White people, I have thin lips. Yes. So really, I, I look more like a monkey than, than anyone else. But, you know, but then there's the whole racist stereotype that, that you yeah, know, 19th to this century, day still goes. The 19th century anthropologist is probably the most racist period in the most racist branch of science there ever was. And, and it's, it's evident by the moment you start categorizing people and then ranking them, well, you're going to rank yourself at the top hmm. and that will deeply bias you 
for what you look for and what you cite as evidence to support your biased view. And you don't even think you have a biased view. But these biased views fed the entire um, eugenics movement. Mm. The eugenics movement was let's, let's purify the human race by preventing the undesirables from mating, right? And sterile, forced sterilization, all of this. Yeah. A little known fact is the eugenics movement, which was big in the United States in the 1910s and 20s, fed the philosophies of Adolf Hitler as he rose up in the 30s. But we want to distance ourselves from him. Why, why wouldn't you? But if you actually part the curtains, there's the intersection of what race is superior and what race isn't. And that is foundational to Hitler's writings and it was foundational to the eugenics movement. Yeah, I mean, when I and so, hear But it, in the, compa the comparisons go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 in, in the book that I wrote, it's, I say, I didn't just come up with that. I said to myself, suppose the 19th century had racist black anthropologists. <laughs> 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 let's, just turn, let's just turn the tables. Let's make them racist and see what they would come up with. Huh. Of course, they'd have to put themselves at the top yeah. and now find all the similarities between white people and chimpanzees. And it start with the fully hairy bodies, the huge ears, the I have big ears, and the person who wants. I look at my ear here. How big is that? Pretty small. All right. Yeah. And people say, "Well, how about Obama? He's first black president, and he's got big ears. He's exactly half white." Well, he's we, probably we more call than him a black white. president. Well, no, no, yeah, he, oh, yeah. His dad comes from Africa. His he's mom exactly is totally white. He's exactly half white. half white. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. No doubt those big ears come from his mama. Okay, so the point is, I'm just saying, it's, look, look how easy it is to be racist. Right. And take a look at a chimpanzee's lips. They're, they're razor thin, all right? And, and we've got some very famous large-lipped black people, you know, Jay-Z among them, all right? I don't have small lips. So they overlooked so much, Yeah. okay? Do you, uh, one, I got to add one, just while you went there, so I'm going to add one. Let's go. Um, do you know lice outbreaks are 30 times more likely in white people than in black people? Really? The lice just don't enjoy black hair. Okay. okay? <laughs> whatever, for, for whatever reasons, whatever it is 30 times more likely. Okay? Just if you just you put lice in the hair, it'll want to go to the white per people's hair. We ever see chimpanzees pruning each other? Oh, yeah. They pick the They're lice out. They're picking out the yeah, lice. Right. And they, apparently, lice is tasty because they eat it. Um, so this is a huge exercise. And anyhow, it goes on and on and on. The fact that you have never, likely never seen black children walk by a tree and say, I want to build a house in that tree and live there. <laughs> okay? This, this is like a suburban white kid thing. All right? And so that racist black anthropologist would say, these are just white people wanting to return to their roots in the trees. Okay. <laughs> it's all, look how easy it is to be a racist. Um, easy, you yeah. could totally do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, for example, like when, when Kanye says that he loves Hitler, I don't think he realized that during the Nazi reign of Germany that mixed kids were actually sterilized because Hitler – did not want them muddling up yep. his perfect race. Yep. Yep. Kanye has four mixed kids. You have mixed kids. Like you, you know what I'm saying? So it's just sort of like the ignorance when you don't really know the knowledge and the history allows you to, to say dumb things like, I love Hitler as a black man. <laughs> <laughs> Think that somehow Hitler wouldn't have killed him if he had the chance. Yes. yes. Right. Or enslaved him or whatever. Yeah. Or, or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. So you get your PhD. And you actually join the Hayden Planetarium, which you eventually become the a director of a, a few years, years, years later. later. I did a, and, a and this is kind of this is kind of where you started, and now you came back as the head of the same planetarium. Yes, yeah, as a kid, I was there, mm -hmm. and so that that imbues within me a certain sense of obligation. No, that sounds burdensome. Duty, a sense of duty that. Whatever I create there with our mixture of scientists and educators, that they will have the power of influence of a next generation of students the way the scientists and educators did on me. That's the least I could do for a city in, in, in which I grew up. 
Well, in 2001, uh, former President uh, George W. Bush appointed you uh, to serve on the Commission on the Future of the United States Aerospace Industry. So did you actually meet Bush and everything else during that time? So, no, I actually, well, I, it depends what you mean by meet. Uh, we were in the same room together, but I didn't officially shake his hands and get a okay. photo Fair. with him. But it was, a, it was a White House commission, and there were 12 of us to study. Uh, the aerospace industry had been on hard times. There was a, a lot of consolidation in the industry. Innovation wasn't, you need, you need diversity of corporate landscape to have some hope of innovation. Otherwise, the big corporations settle on what has always worked. And so there was a congressional concern, bipartisan congressional concern, that this would affect our commerce, our security, and our um, transportation. Because the aerospace industry makes our airplanes, they make our jets, and they make the cargo planes. So uh, we went around the world studying this problem and then reported back to the White House. Yeah. Right. And a few years later, in 2004, you served on the President's Commission on Implementation of United States Space Exploration Policy, a.k.a. Moon, Mars, and Beyond. Moon, Mars. Yeah, we had to tighten up that title. Right. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. So I was twice appointed by President Bush. That's correct. Okay. And in Moon, Mars, and Beyond, what was, what did you conclude in, in this whole program? Yeah, if you were to sum it up in a way. Yeah. So, yeah, I can easily sum it up. The question is, why continue this? Why spend money up there if we have problems down here on Earth? This is the, a perennial concern. And it's, it's a genuine concern when people express it. I don't ever want to make light of it because your problems that you confront on Earth are very real to you. And whatever benefits going to space might bring are distant and abstract. So um, we, we mapped a route that within budget – would enable NASA to continue its path of exploration, uh, maintain the shuttle for some number of years, but then as you phase out the shuttle, you phase in a rocket that would then get you to Mars. But doing this on a time frame that is within the budget that NASA had continued to be receiving at that time. And that way we wouldn't be stalled going into space. And a backdrop of that was the rest of the world increasing their interest in space, including China launching their first astronaut. Of course, they, they'd be called a Taikonaut. And China says, <laughs> I, I put this in one of my books, um, speculation, but I'm all in on it, which is, we don't invite China to participate in the International Space Station. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yes. They were disinvited. Huh. We, we invited Russia. Yeah. Okay. Right. Russia, because they're brilliant people in Russia who were working on space, we don't want them to go to our enemies, whoever they were identified geopolitically at the time, bring them with us, then they are our allies. And that's why this, the space station is primarily the United States and Russia yeah. and European um, uh, uh, other nations as well. But the, the big players were the United States and Russia because we had the spacecraft that'll get astronauts to the space station, okay? It was a space shuttle and the Soyuz. Okay, so there's no China. What were the reasons? Oh, human rights violations. It was a political statement of our disapproval of their ways. Well, Russia didn't have human rights I don't violations. know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I'm not. You can't invoke rational thought <laughs> on geo on a geopolitical landscape. Right. You can only invoke geopolitics. Okay. So I think I have no evidence for this. No evidence. I think deep down, someone somewhere said, if we disinvite China, we know they're gonna do this on their own. They're gonna make their own space station. They're gonna put their own people in orbit. They have the they have the resources, their economy was uh, was on a tear. They they're gonna do it. And that'll spook us into redoubling our space efforts because now we have a new adversary to replace the Soviet Union, which is the role they played when we went to the moon. So fast forward a few dec uh, 15 years, and what do we have now? China says they want to put astronauts on the moon. Oh, we have the Artemis program. Hmm. 
returning to the moon. Right. And and you, you part the curtains. Well, why? Oh, it's the right thing to do. Oh, yeah, we just, it's exploration. We're going to do that. We could have done, we could have stayed on the moon in 1972, did we? No. We could have gone back by 1980. No. 1990. No. 2000. No. Yeah. 2010. No. Right. Oh, right now. We're going back now. So I think that whatever that thinking was back then is working because people feel threatened by a frenemy around the world. For everyone that says that the, the 1970s moon landing was fake, that it was done in a Hollywood studio somewhere, what do you say to them? Well, I have several replies. One of them is, isn't it amazing that our technological and scientific achievements are so great that members of the civilization that created it are in denial of it. <laughs> what a compliment to how far that technology has come. Nice. What a compliment. Thank you for the compliment. Thank you for the compliment. That, that, it's, that it's mystery and magic to you done on a Hollywood set. What a, what a compliment that is. But <laughs> two other re responses. So this is a joke, actually. This next one is a joke, but it's, it's a fun joke. So, uh, so NASA goes to Hollywood, and they say, okay, we, we got to fake this moon landing. So what, what will it require? Yeah. And they said, well, we got to do this, and we got to we have to actually have a launch, all right, because people see the launch, and we got to do this. Right. We got we to have a set, and we have to evacuate it, and so that the dust falls quickly, and have to put them on point joists so that they look like it's not it's, it's not regular gravity. And and we, but we did all this research, and we we concluded that this what's way simpler than that is to film it on location. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so they filmed it on location. They, 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 they faked it on location. All right. So the, the third one is um, there's 10,000 scientists and engineers, plus, plus or minus a few thousand. There's, you saw the launch. You can calculate how much fuel is in that rocket. The rocket is 36 stories tall, and the astronauts are up here. And the rest of that is fuel. Mm -hmm. It's a controlled bomb, basically. And they're right here. All right. And then they launch. And we have warehouses of engineering drawings trying to get this Saturn V off the ground. And all of the, the, the preliminary ones, you've seen the videos of rockets exploding on the launch pad. Thankfully, no one was aboard. They were test runs. So all of this is happening leading up to the Saturn V rocket. So there it is. I would submit to you that to fake all of that would require so much effort that you might as well just do it, okay? And calculate how much fuel this is. That's enough fuel to go into orbit, go to the moon, orbit the moon, come back to Earth. That's how much fuel is actually in the rocket. Mm -hmm. And it launched. Where do you think it was going? To like the, the, the piggly wiggly? The, to get groceries? Where do you think this rocket was going? I'm sorry, I'm screaming at you here, sorry. One thing that all conspiracy theorists have in common, all of them, mm -hmm. is they already know the answer that they want. Mm. And where they don't have data to support it, they invoke a cover-up. Mm. And that enables them to gap across places that they cannot otherwise support with data. I had a friend who, a full-grown man, otherwise rational, said to me, Neil, I don't, you know, I've read the websites that, uh, that doubt that we landed on the moon, and they're pretty convincing to me. But if you tell me that we landed on the moon, I'll believe you. And I said, it has nothing to do with my authority over information about what you should believe. It was interesting because he respected me enough that my simple statement would over. I, I asked him, what evidence do you seek that would have you believe that we landed on the moon? He said, well, if we had photos of the landing sites, because you can't do that from Earth because the, through the atmosphere, the resolution is not fine enough to see that. But I, we, the Japanese have sent satellites that orbited the moon and 
reconnaissance satellite. They got. Four, I said, um, there's this satellite, and uh, and four years ago, whenever I had this conversation with him, it got images, and you can see the landing site. You can see the tracks from the rover, and you can see the all right. And he said, okay. So he goes. And the next day, he said, Neil, I saw that website, and but I noticed that the NASA logo was also on that website, along with the Japan. Jaxa, all right? <laughs> and so I don't know if I can trust it. I said, you asked me what evidence would convince you. I just presented you that evidence and you're not convinced. There's nothing more this conversation can do. I can't, I, I can't, you, there's, yeah, we're done here. We're done. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> well, uh, around the time that you were working uh, with the government on, on the commission and so forth, you were actually were living near the World Trade Center on 9/11. Still do, yes. Oh, you still do, yes. So you Four heard you heard the the planes hit the building and everything else like that. So the I was on. I did not see the first plane. Mm -hmm. uh, there was just smoke. You know, I went to vote that morning. It was a Tuesday. There was some primary of some some lesser uh, election. And I'm walking back, and the smoke coming out of the and there's si sirens. So that's odd. You know, it's a bad accident, um, tragic accident. And everyone else is thinking the same thing. And so I was worried because I'm closer to the base of the towers than they are tall, which means if it falls, it could fall on my building. So if you want to know the math of that, it's kind of fun. If to see the top of the building, if your sight line is higher than 45 degrees, that means you are closer to the base of the building than the building is tall. And so I, so I went out with my camcorder, which is all we had at the time, camcorders, and I zoomed in. I had a 9X optical zoom just to see how bad is this? Is it going to collapse? If it does, how might it collapse? At that point, this huge explosion comes out the South Tower. And my view from the south of the South Tower was blocked by the Hilton Millennium Hotel. Um, and so... This huge, biggest explosion I've ever seen, rivaling Hollywood, rivaling the explosion in, in Die Hard, where the entire floor blows out from the C4. It was bigger than that, bigger than that. And I remember cowering from the pulse, the radiative pulse of this explosive energy. And, um, and that's when people freaked out in the, in the road because it goes from a sad accident to, oh my gosh, this is a terrorist attack, we are, we're under attack. People did the, did the probability instantly in their heads. You don't have two buildings explode in that moment, within an hour. So um, I remembered having not seen the plane because our view was blocked. There's this huge explosion, but there's no shockwave. And I said, hmm, how could we not have a shockwave? That's odd. So I wonder what blew up. I would later learn it's rocket fuel, basically. And it's something called a deflagration wave, where if you atomize fuel and you ignite it in one place, there's a rate at which the flame will move through the atomized particles and the vapor. And that's a deflagration wave. And that can have quite a bit of pressure built up within it, but nothing like the shock wave of an explosion from a bomb. If you study explosions like uh, the the Oklahoma City explosion, that shattered windows quarter mile away. That's the shock wave that does the damage when you have such an explosion uh, from a bomb. If it's just fire, if it's just fuel catching fire abruptly, it's a very different phenomenon. And so, it, so it barely made any noise. I mean, it was like a it was in the din of the background city noises that you could see it, but you definitely felt it. Yeah, crazy. That was definitely a crazy, a crazy day in America. Right, and it was an assault on America, assault on my city, but it was also an assault on my backyard. Yeah, my two kids were nine months and and five, or five and a half, and I said five, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five and a half, and we would the World Trade Center Plaza. We would push them through on strollers and we'd look up and walk around it. And so it was a, it was a multiple assault on my neighborhood. 
Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely a rough time for us. Yeah. Well, by 2004, that's when you started to host uh, Origins on PBS. Yes. Actually, uh, just before that, uh, I hosted a spinoff from, from Nova called Nova Science Now. Okay. Which is Nova, you may remember, is it's narrated, a disembodied voice, and it's, it's a document, narrative documentary. Nova Science Now, I was host, and I would go around, I'd have correspondence and reporting on the science of the world. And it was, it was a fun sort of exposure to the world of television. Because as a professor, I kind of require that I can see your eyes in an audience to know, are you falling asleep? Am I interesting to you? Is the subject interesting? Is it, you know, what? Uh, and that's, that feedback is important for me to become a better educator. But if I'm just looking at a camera lens, that took, I would, it took me more than a year to get comfortable with it. Now I can just stare at a camera lens and imagine there are thousands of people on the other side and then feel the same energy I would if I were in a live audience. So that was, that was sort of a proving ground for me. And then, um, then I, I hosted... A, a Nova special, a couple of them, and then a Cosmos would call. Yeah. Right. Now, was this around the same time that you started to question Pluto being a planet? Yeah. So Pluto- and, and Let me just say this. I grew up, you know- Don't get me started. School, Meet me outside. School, Pluto was the ninth planet. That's what I you know, learned growing up as a kid, but you messed all that up. No, I was an accessory. An accessory to messing all that I, I would, up. Okay. I did not pull the trigger. You didn't pull the trigger. Okay. Definitely drove the getaway car. Okay. <laughs> I will admit that. Confess that. So Pluto had issues. From the day it was discovered, it had issues. Okay. Many of them were swept under the rug because it was just nice to have discovered a planet in the 20th century. All right. One had been discovered in the, in the 19th century and in the 18th century. So that would be Uranus and Neptune. So there was strong urges to keep Pluto alive. But beginning in the 1970s, as we got better and better data on the size of Pluto, it was like smaller than people had previously hoped it would be. It was, had less mass. It would be less disruptive in the outer solar system with its gravity than people were projecting for it. And so you look at textbooks in the 1970s, when they have the enumeration of the planets, Pluto is lumped together with the comets and the asteroids. Pluto, comet, and other vagabonds of the solar system. That's where we started thinking about Pluto in that context as early as the 1970s. So Pluto had it coming. The, the writing was on the wall, and what really called the jury in, or whatever the legal term would be, was... We, colleagues of mine at a telescope in Hawaii, discovered another object in a similar orbit to Pluto that had similar properties to Pluto. Hmm. So maybe Pluto was not alone in this zone. And they kept looking and they found other and more and more and more. And once you map it out, it's a new, it's, a, it's like a belt of objects, icy objects in the outer solar system. And we named it for someone who predicted that it could be there. And his name is Gerard Kuiper. And so it's called the Kuiper Belt of Comets. So Pluto wasn't, Pluto wasn't the ninth planet. Pluto was the first and one of the more significant objects in a new swath, swath of real estate. Huh. So we didn't lose a planet. We gained the Kuiper Belt. Okay. And I think Pluto's happier that way. <laughs> okay. it's, the, it's the king of the comets rather than being the puniest of the planets. Okay. Uh, and then by 2007, you became a regular on the universe, on the History Channel. Oh, uh, yeah. The History Channel called me. I said, why, why are you doing the universe? You're the Hitler Channel, those who may remember the era. Uh, anytime you put it on, there's some World War something II. Something about Hitler, right. Something about Hitler. They're the Hitler Channel. So well, we want to broaden out. And I didn't really trust them at first. I said, who else are you interviewing? And they gave me the list. And they, they were good people. They did their homework. Like, I know these people, and they're good. They're good on a camera. they got good expertise. I said, fine, I will participate. But you know what they did? They interviewed all of my colleagues in their expertise. And then they came back to me and asked me the same question they asked everybody. Hmm. And then 
They just picked my answer or their answer for their final edit. <laughs> and I ended up being more than half of the FaceTime out of what was at least a dozen people that they showed me that they would have. I had people coming up to me after and say, well, I love that new TV documentary you're hosting. And I said, no. I just interviewed. No. And so from that point onward, I have a policy. If I'm, if I'm interviewed for a, you didn't ask this, but I, just, I have a policy. If I'm interviewed for a documentary, I want to know how many other people are interviewed, and I can't be more than a, a fraction relative to that total. Uh -huh. they got to get the, the contents from other people. Um, I don't mind being a part of it. I don't mind being even a little bit bigger part than my fraction, but I have limits to this so that no one is going to think it's my show. So that no one will think it's my show. It's their show. Yeah. As it should be. Well, I mean, you started doing a lot of television stuff. You were, uh, by 2011, you were the host of PBS uh, Nova Science Now. Yes. You know, and you started to kind of become the most prominent scientist on television. In visible, a most visible. The most yeah. visible. Yeah. Uh, how did that really affect your career? Well, beginning 2000 and... Well, no, beginning in the late 1990s, I was brought to the American Museum of Natural History to help figure out what to do with the then Hayden Planetarium, which was getting a little old. Its attendance was dropping relative to other places in the museum, and it needed, it needed to be overhauled. And so I became project scientist of that overhaul. Hmm. And then we built a brand new Department of Astrophysics uh, where research would be conducted there. And once that happened, I separated myself from Princeton, where I was doing uh, postdoctoral research. And I've been there ever since, which now like almost 30 years. Mm. I... So uh, that, uh, first as an advisor and then to run the planetarium. All this public stuff, um, normally that would count against you mm. academically. They don't want you on TV. Yeah. They want you in the lab. Right. Writing grants, of course. In my case, it I don't think it counted against me. I think it was neutral. Because my title was director of the Hayden Planetarium and also a member of the Department of Astrophysics. So if I'm doing public -y things, you can't fault me for fulfilling a job description. All right. So that's that's how that played out. So initially I had a, a stronger research fraction of my portfolio. It's much less in this moment. I want to resurrect it in the coming years. I have a few more projects, public projects I want to get done. And then I'll, uh, I could be delusional thinking that I'll <laughs> when I'm done with that final book, I'll now go back to the lab. Uh, maybe that's delusional, but I I'm, keep telling myself that, um, that it's going to happen. And so, so yeah, it's, the field, my field is a little more along in embracing someone's public exposure because we know that funding for NASA and the National Science Foundation flows through Congress and Congress is voted by the public. The public knows what we're doing. They might be more interested in learning more about what we do. The James Webb Space Telescope is fully paid by your tax dollars. It makes headlines every time. No matter what it finds, even when it finds nothing, when it should have found something, that's headlines. Okay, so yes, there's a landscape here that most of my colleagues know and understand needs to be brought to the public for the health of everything. I can't say the same for physics or some other branches of science. They're a little behind on this, and we had some very good leaders in this in this exercise, uh, especially uh, the likes of Carl Sagan was first out of the box, really, yeah. to do this in a big way. Well, in 2014, uh, you did an interview, and they asked you, uh, what do you think about God? And you said, I remain unconvinced by any claims anyone has ever made about the existence or the power of a divine force operating in the universe. Right? Yeah. I, I would have said something like that, for sure. Uh -huh. Right. And, you know, since oh, then— oh, by the way, by the way, just to be clear— Yeah. Uh, what's probably missing from your extracted quote mm -hmm. is the setup for that, which would be, is there a particular God you have in mind that you want me to comment on? Huh. Okay. I missed that. Because, yeah, you, if, you go to a, if you go to 
you go online and you, in, a, in a Google search, you type God, gods worshiped by humans. There's a tally of all the gods ever worshiped by humans in the history of civilization. And it just goes screen after screen after screen after screen. So when you say, do you believe in God? Is there, is it, which God? Is it Zeus? Is it Poseidon? Is it the, the Jewish God? Is it the Christian God? Because the Jewish God from the Old Testament is filled with wrath, okay? All right, and, and smoting and smiting and whatever the, the, the past tense verb is. And so, to, and the New Testament, the, God is kinder, all right? A little nicer, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right, so you look at all of this and you say, is that the God you want me to comment on? Or is there some other God? Typically, it's the Judeo-Christian blend there. In that context, I would say in my studies of the universe, I, I value evidence and I don't see evidence for any kind of um, active intelligence or power over anything. Yeah. But you, if you had it, if you didn't show it to me, I'm yeah. all in. Well, I mean, you said you don't like to be labeled an atheist, more agnostic. Yeah. And the definition of agnostic is a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God. Yeah, I'm not or all, anything. I'm not, that's, I, agnostic comes closer to what I am than atheist does. Yeah. But all of that rest of that baggage that agnostic carries is, is off the edges for me. Okay. So the reason why I disavow the atheist title is very simple. The most visible atheists today say things, do things, and think things that I don't do. Such as? Oh, um, they're quick to use CE and BCE when referencing dates on the calendar. Okay. CE, common era, yeah. BCE, BCE before. before they have eschewed the, the uh, a, a BC and AD, because that, that makes a religious reference. I totally celebrate AD and BC hmm. because the calendar that we currently use, the Gregorian calendar, yeah. what came out under Pope Gregory, who figured out that the leap day system of ancient Rome doesn't work. You have to adjust that. And so they adjusted it and corrected the calendar. A whole lot of astronomical analysis. Right, because there's no zeros in the Roman calendar. In the, well, in the Roman, well, Roman had, system. zero was not invented yet. Yeah, exactly. So that's not the only reason. Uh, yes, because Roman numerals, you cannot represent zero yes. with Roman numerals, exactly. interestingly. I don't know if you've ever thought of that. Yeah. There's no zero there. Mm -hmm. So so it's not just that zero got invented afterwards. It's that the relationship between the day of the year and where Earth is in its orbit was more precisely defined, or rather where the sun is in its orbit around Earth. We were still largely, among many, we were geocentric at the time. But it doesn't matter if you're accounting for time frames. Point is, if they put in the hard work, I'm going to respect that. And I'm not, I'm not going to sweep that under the rug. My favorite musical on Broadway, which I saw in real time because that's how old I am, was Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I listen to that every Easter and then some. Okay? I'm, I'm a, I, 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 I love culture as a binding force of civilization. They're atheist Jews, ardent atheist Jews who still celebrate a Passover Seder. Uh, I'm an atheist Jew. Yeah, atheist Jew. Right. And you, you still leave the empty seat for, for Elijah mm -hmm. and unlock the door. By the way, if someone did walk through the door, you'd probably shoot him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that seems to be what you can do these days. But you, you're not literally thinking that's going to happen. So there's a cultural exercise that you go through. So, so, there's, so there's that. Also, I don't chase people down when they speak of their religious allegiances. I might ask them about it, but I'm not going to challenge them. I, I value the diversity of people's spiritual expression in this country where it is protected and in the world, not every place where it continues to be protected or where it was ever protected. So I once said in my Facebook post, I had a friend going up on the shuttle to fix the Hubble telescope, one of the servicing missions. And I said, uh, my friend is going up, fix the Hubble, great. Um, Godspeed, STS, one, I forgot the number. STS is how they numbered the shuttle missions. But I forgot the specific number. I said, Godspeed. What did someone say right after that? 
Godspeed, I thought you were an atheist. <laughs> Here's my point. If my behavior triggers people to say, I thought you were an atheist, then I'm not an atheist. Because words in the dictionary, words are not defined by the dictionary. They're described in a manner that reflects how words come into use. Otherwise, we'd still be speaking like Chaucer. Yeah. So, so atheist today comes with expectations of what you're going to say and do. And since I don't fulfill that, we need another word for me. I don't know. And, and agnostic, agnostic was like, agnostic was like, maybe that. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think I'm probably more agnostic as well. Listen, I have Christian people in my family and I totally respect their point of view. You know, I'll say words like God willing and people are like, I thought you didn't believe in God. Well, that's, what, that's, know, my that's, yeah, that's my a point. Yeah. It's a whole kind of clusterfuck of, mm -hmm. of ideas. You know. Oh, by the way, if you, by the way, as a scientist, if you are religious and you say something that is patently, objectively false, I will tell you. I'm not going to respect your views if they're objectively false. As I owe that to your intellect to explain to you what is objectively true in the face of what you think is true, want to be true, or wish for, for what is true. So when you say the Christian, I respect it, I don't respect that's, that's not the operative word for me. Um, I, I respect your freedom to think whatever you want. But if you're going to make a decision based on something that's objectively false, that emanates from your belief system, no matter what it is, I'm obligated. As an educator, I say, you know, that's not going to work. Or here's why it's not going to work. Well, you're advising someone else who doesn't know better. And that's not in their best interest. Yeah, I'm going to say that. What's your take about the concept of the soul? So, you know, for example, I saw an interview with Jizza, who was on your show yeah, at yeah. one point. The he, he believes yeah. in the soul, mm -hmm. but he also believes in science and, and, and so forth. Do you think there's such a thing as a soul? So let's go back 120 years. Okay. The discovery of x-rays. Okay, Wilhelm Röntgen. They're still called Röntgen rays in Europe. We call them x-rays. They, You can see through the body and see bones and things, all right? You realize religious people of the day said, we can see into the body. Let's x-ray people while they're on their deathbed. And as they die, let's see if we can see something rising up out of the body. Huh. I'm all for that. Okay, a new tool. You think something is true and they want to test it. Of course, they didn't see anything. Didn't see anything. Okay. Um, but I admire the urge to test a claim hmm. or a supposition. All right. Fast forward to today, like, who are you? Is there something in you that lives independent of your physical existence? That would be the soul. what a soul yeah. would be. All right. Uh, all right. What I do know is everything you are derives from electrochemical synapses running in your brain. This is a great triumph for our understanding of physiology. Aristotle said, your feelings are in your heart. He got a lot wrong in the sciences, especially <laughs> in the physical sciences, that among them. Yep. Uh, but he was trying, he was trying. I applaud the effort, like I say. So you, so, well, here's something interesting. You go to a funeral parlor and your friend Frederick just died, let's say. And you go to the funeral parlor. You don't say, hey, which room is Freddie in? You say, where is the body of Fred? Mm -hmm. We all say that. That's a tacit admission that the body of Fred is not Fred. That Fred is something else that's no longer there. And that matches perfectly with the concept of a soul. But even if you don't believe in souls, you're probably still the person who's going to say, where's the body of Fred? Mm. So you recognize there was something there when they were alive that isn't there when they're dead. Well, what is it that was there when they were alive? Well, we have some evidence for this. The neurosynapses of your brain. And how do we know the brain is you? Because you can stroke out 
bits by bits of your brain, we do the scan of the brain and the whole sections that just shut down. And as that happens, if it's a multiple strokes rather than one massive stroke, um, as that happens, you lose the ability to speak, you lose knowledge of who you are, of where you, all the things that we associate with you, you lose your personality. And in the limit, none of your brain works except the basal motor functions that keeps your heart alive. You're still alive. Where's your soul now? When I can't even talk to you. You don't even know where you are or what you're doing or what's happening to you. You have no awareness. So I, I'm, I remain unconvinced that the soul is something other than words we, a word we give to your neurosynaptic thoughts that enable you to say, I am an individual and I have a consciousness. Mm. But that consciousness is linked to the activity of your brain. And when you die, your brain shuts down just the same way it died, um, just the same way your brain shuts down if you're brain dead. So I would assert that the you is neither in the dead body where there's no brain function or in the living body where there's no brain function. Localizing the activity to the brain. Do you think there'll be a point in the future where humans will be able to cheat death in the way of removing their brain and putting it into a different body or putting it into a robot body to preserve? Unnecessary. You know, Unnecessary. No? We'll just mess with the genome and you live forever. Mess with the genome. Yeah, just change the genes in a way so that they don't age. We're uh -huh. much closer to that than separating but, your brain out and putting, it, mice already. and putting it in a jar. They're doing that with mice. There are ways we can prolong the life of other animals, but uh, they don't live forever. They just live longer than they otherwise would have. So I think we're much closer to that manipulation of the genome than removing the brain from your skull and sticking it in a jar. And, uh, you know, I, I fantasize we have two diseases, very terrible disease. We have Alzheimer's and we have ALS. You know, one destroys the brain, but your body's intact. One destroys the body and your brain is intact. So I always imagine a future where you can do a brain body transplant, at least get one whole body out of that, right? Mm. But we all agree that if you put the brain of the ALS patient into the body of the Alzheimer's patient, that person is, the, is not the Alzheimer's person. We all, mm. the, it wouldn't be hard to convince people of this. Even though their body is the original Alzheimer's body, their brain is the other person, and that's who that person becomes. Have you heard, there's a guy named uh, Peter Nygaard. You know who this is? Don't know. He's a Canadian billionaire who's, I believe, in prison right now uh, for all types of, you know, trafficking type, type charges and so forth. So I did an interview with Chris Hansen, who did a lot of research about him and so forth. And essentially, by the time Peter Nygaard got locked up, and he's, you know, in his 80s, I believe, at that point, what he was doing was he was using stem cells to keep himself younger. And what he would do is he would have girlfriends who he would impregnate and then have abortions. Then he would take the abortion matter. And since stem cells from your DNA are much more, you know, compatible than stem cells from other people, he would then take these stem cells from these abortions and somehow inject them and made himself more vibrant. And they said that when he got locked up after six months, he started to like fall apart. Do you know about this? No. Okay. Does it sound plausible? Well, of the many ways we are attempting to prolong life, uh, one of them is deep into stem cell research. From what I, I'm not an expert here in this space, but what I remember is the whole conversation about uh, aborted fetuses um, changed because we were able to produce stem cells from your own cells. Somebody developed a method to do that. So that whole conversation about what do you do with abortions went away. I don't think you've seen it in the news recently. I haven't for sure. Yeah. So I think there were some advances that enabled this from, from your own cells. Whatever is the pathway to prolonging life, um, I think that will happen before we, we sever your brain from your brainstem and keep it alive. Mm. The, you have to be careful, though, if you want to live forever. For me, knowing I'm going to die gives meaning to what it is to be alive. 
if I know I'm going to die, I got this much time left. No, this much time. I, I got it. I better get busy. I be, better get this done. I, I don't know. I got to get it done now and be as good at it as I can possibly be. It brings focus to life. So mathematically, if knowing you're going to die brings meaning to your life, then the prospect of living forever means you will have a life of no meaning at all, mathematically speaking. Well, you could say that, but you could also say that- Well, it's mathematically true. It wouldn't be socially true. Well, the life expectancy in 2023 compared to, let's say, 500 years ago was what? Probably four times. You know, people back then were dying in their 30s. No, no. So, yeah. So, interestingly, the, our life expectancy had not changed much from caveman up to the early 1800s. Okay. It was in, That's why in I the said 30s. 500 years ago. You wouldn't yeah. have to go far, that far back is okay. my point. Okay. You go 200 years back. Yeah. 200 years. Yeah. Totally. 200 years back. So, most of these advances are in the last 150 years. Exactly. Introduction of sanitation, ch- um, uh, prenatal child care. Refrigeration. Uh, uh, yeah, all of this. All of that. Factors in. Penicillin, yeah, goes on and on. It reminds me of a comic. There are two cavemen sitting around a fire, and one of them says to the other, you know, our water runs clean, our our, our air is pure, our animals are free range, yet we're still dying in our 30s. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought, what do we do wrong? <laughs> this is a complete advertisement for science, right? right? Um, so, uh, so let me just say that we know intuitively – that if you're going to die, there's meaning there because you would not bring a bouquet of plastic flowers to a loved one. They would, they, would, they would not think much of that gift. Well, why if the plastic flowers will live forever? <laughs> Isn't that a better gift than ones that will die six days later? Yeah. But what happens, you give the flowers that, that – you, you gift living flowers and then the person receives them. Now they have to take care of them. They got to find a vase. Put it in the vase. Do some trimming. Over the days, the the petals open up in response to light from the window. There's a fragrance that comes from them. They get nurtured. You replace the water. Six days later, seven days later, the the stem of the flower weakens as they enter their period of senescence. And the bulb can no longer be held upright. And then they get discarded. The fact that those flowers were going to die meant it, it captured the attention of the person tending to them. Mm. The, the, it created a relationship between the person and the flower that had meaning. If you were gifted plastic flowers, you would have no relationship with them at all. It would become visual wallpaper in your home. So I submit to you that things that die bring this upon us culturally, emotionally, psychologically, the valuation of who and what they are in our short time on earth. Yeah, that's cool. I still want to live forever, but you know. Well, if everyone lived forever, <laughs> we would need another planet. We would need another planet. Okay. Exactly. Sorry. I just put that out. Start terraforming Mars before you, okay. you accomplish And we'll get this. to that. 2016, you got in rap beef. Got B.O.B. What? You got into a rap oh, beef. Oh, with B.O.B. With B.O.B. Okay. With B.O.B. Mm-hmm. So B.O.B. was very outspoken about the earth being flat. He's not the only person that said this before. Uh, You know, later on, Kyrie Irving said something similar. I remember when I interviewed uh, the basketball player, Iman Shumpert, he was convinced the earth is flat as well. They asked me to cut out the footage. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The interview. But, you know, which I did. I can still talk about it, though. Uh, So B.O.B. actually dropped a diss record aimed at you. Indeed called Flatline. Indeed he did. And there's a line there that says, hey, Neil Tyson need to loosen up his vest. They probably write that man one hell of a check. I mean, you were paid to lie to everyone about the earth being round. He has to say that to continue to believe what he wants to believe. This is the gapping of the absence of data by conspiracy theorists. He has, to, he has to somehow account for me saying what I'm saying right. by inventing something that he needs to be true so he can continue to believe it. That you're being paid off by the powers that be, by the Illuminati or whoever else, 
to lie to everyone, and that's to say that the Earth is round and that's when it's not, really flat. And that's not why I engaged him publicly. Right. I engaged him publicly because on Twitter, he was citing, if you do the math, you get the calculation. He was, he was, <laughs> he, you, you do not walk into my house and tell people to do the math and show that Earth is flat. Okay. That's so, your house. okay. Well, I have my, house, my, you know, yeah. my space. Your domain. My, my, my place. That's right. Yeah. You can say whatever you want out there. All right. So, so my nephew, who's into hip hop, okay, academically and professionally, um, his name is Stephen Tyson Jr. He's into hip hop. Um, he's got a few albums out there. Okay. Just Listen Entertainment is the Just Listen. I think there's no first T there, just listen. Uh, he, I said, I said, Steve, what, what do I do here? Well, you got to do a rebuttal or whatever. There's a word for it. But right. um, if he's diss, I had to diss him back. Right. So. You had a song called Flat to Fact. Okay. There was, he composed it. Okay. Okay. I, I you know, <laughs> he, he composed it. And so that was the rap wars basically over whether Earth is flat. And then I was invited on Larry Wilmore. Uh, he had a cute segment for his nighttime talk show on on comedy. Center. Very cute segment. He's reading the news stories about uh, the Bob and Kyrie Irving. He says, "This this sounds like an emergency. What what do I do?" And he has this red button, you know, science emergency call, science emergency call, and the red lights turn, and and I and I appear in the back doorway eating a sandwich. I said, you know. Larry, I'm trying to eat my dinner. I got the, the, the stress call. What's the matter? He said, Neil, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> and, so, and so I then give a little recitation at the end with a mic drop. And so then I, then I left it because it was fun, uh, very pop culture-y. Uh, but I, you know, there's a limit to how much of my time uh, I can spend on this sort of thing. And by the way, Kyrie Irving, he's paid to play basketball. And as far as he's concerned, the court is flat. You can think <laughs> Earth is flat, and there are many jobs you can still have in society. Right. One of them is in the NBA. I'm not, I'm not going to chase him down. I'd love to have a conversation with him, but I'm not going to publicly denounce him. I will if the government says, we need Kyrie Irving to run NASA. Then I got to stand up. <laughs> but as long as he's a great basketball player, I miss him here on the Brooklyn – you know, in Brooklyn, yeah. um, but, you know, a lot of jobs for you if you think Earth is flat. How do you sum up to someone who says that, that the Earth is actually round? How can you quickly prove that? Uh, <laughs> we have pictures. Okay. Uh, well, but then they'll say okay, those okay, pictures okay, are here, 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 here. Okay. Me and Amon Shumper went back and forth. Oh, uh, I don't believe those pictures. Okay. So, all right. So... All right. I might ask, what would convince you that Earth was a sphere? What would convince you? If nothing, then um, it's time to end the conversation. Or I will also say, here's a good one. You ready? Okay. And this is what happened to us all. We're, we're here now in the East Coast, uh, the Eastern time zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Especially in the winter, you're watching Sunday football. There's a, the sun sets in New York at 4.30 in the afternoon, in midwinter, right in the, the heart of the football season. Okay. A football game in L.A., at that same time, it's daytime. The sun is up. Yeah. Okay? It's three hours. It's 1 o'clock in the – it's 1.30 in the afternoon. The sun is high in the sky. And you know that's happening now. The game is live. Mm-hmm. So how is it that the sun is set for us and then you go west and the sun is not yet set for them? Can you explain that? And I've yet to hear any of them explain this. And that's a good sports reference. And that will work no matter where you are if you are east of a sporting event that happens to your west. So I, that seems to me to be pretty convincing. That will happen if the surface is curved and the sun is setting below it. Or you could just get into a plane and keep flying one direction and see if you fall off the edge. I mean, there's that. <laughs> yeah, they'd have to charter a plane for that. So, right. so I'm, 
I, I like the fact that people want to be skeptical, right. but you want you don't want to be so open minded that your brains spill out and lose the capacity to analyze what is authentic data, authentic evidence from whatever rabbit warren you fell into on YouTube to end up believing what you think it's true out there in spite of what established experimental evidence tells you. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2017, you showed up on Logic's album, Everybody Is God. Yes. Uh, on a Which went track. platinum, by the way. Which went platinum. And right. he sends me this plat. I didn't know you, you all do this, right? Oh, yeah. There's like a whole, oh, yeah. the I don't, I don't the have thing. wall space. With, I got astronomy pictures on my wall. You move those aside. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know. Make well for the logic It's, plaque. it's yeah. got a plaque. It's, it's big. Yep. It's got a plaque. It's got my name on it. It's got the platinum album. It's got the album cover. And that's that famous painting the, from ancient Greece where yeah, exactly. all the characters and yeah, mine. Which they, he redid for the he album. He did and my yep. face is one of the paintings. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're on there. Nice. Yeah, I'm on there. Nice. You, you look at a magnifying glass. You'll find it. Well, in 2018, they tried to meet to you, which you ultimately, after all types of investigations, everything got dropped and you went back with your career. Was that a rough time for you and your family? So all I have to say about that is to live in a time where the simple act of being accused is sufficient for people to think you're guilty. Yeah. And the, the simple act of being the accuser has everyone convinced that you're innocent and have not capable of wrongdoing. If that's the case, then we don't need a justice system. Just meet out justice by up and down votes on social media and imprison people and let people go free just based on that. So I'm glad I live in a country where there's due process and investigation. That's the whole point of investigations. So it's, um, there are countries where, no, it's just the, the whim of whoever is in charge decides what is justice and what is not. And so, uh, yeah, but as a movement, by the way, the Me Too movement should have been in high gear decades earlier. We had plenty of evidence of all kinds of stuff that was going on, not the least of which was the, the Clarence Thomas hearings, but you can go way further back than that. We knew this. And it's a, you know, people badmouth social media. And yes, it's a cesspool. I'm, I'm not going to undo that about it. I mean, yes, I wish we could undo it. I'm not going to not say that about it because it is a cesspool. But within there, some very important, interesting forces have arisen that are forces of good, force, uh, progressive forces that have moved the needle on things that previously seemed unmovable. So I think the Me Too movement was welcomed and long overdue in, in society. But as, as a movement, it, it kind of grabs everything, you know, and so you got to sort of look at the edges. Uh, I'm reminded of um, in the French Revolution, uh, very brilliant chemist, Antoine Lavoisier, Lavoisier uh, who discovered oxygen, first understood combustion, uh, discovered hydrogen, named it oxygen, named it hydrogen. Um, he, a very significant chemist, um, he lost his head in the French Revolution. He had some, some connection with the royalty that was, uh, l later on, because a revolution is a revolution, okay? There's no time for nuance or slur. All right. So at the end of the revolution, they realized, okay, now we shouldn't have cut off his head. So they sent an uh, apology letter apology to, to his wife head. and okay. said, sorry, okay? Sorry for cutting off your husband's I, head. I, I, think, I think there was a couple of dollars. Here's his head back if you want it. Uh, it he even helped it, uh, develop the metric system, which wow. came out of France wow, from okay. that time. Very insignificant guy. But it, there was like the movement just sort of took everything. And so, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm just happy for investigations. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the whole point of them. Well, yeah, and I looked to up get some to the of these... truth that the press might not otherwise have access to. Well, yeah, and I looked up some of these allegations, and it was like he had an inappropriate comment 30 years ago, and I, I'm looking at this going like, but I can't even remember some of the women I've dated 30 years ago. This is crazy to to something with no proof, no evidence, someone's word. A lot of times the people are anonymous. 
a lot of times they're money grabs. And uh, I'm sorry you had to go through it. I'm glad that ultimately you were found. Yeah, no, no wrong. Thank you. At the end. Thank you. It's um, yeah. No one is thinking whatever motives might be. I mean, there's the, the, and again, the press wants to adjudicate it, but then the press can have their bias, even if they think they don't. And so that's why you need you need a system of justice. And um, so, yeah. What are your thoughts of uh, Elon Musk? As someone who has been involved in NASA, I feel like it kind of came out of nowhere with the whole SpaceX thing. As someone that was already a billionaire who had a very successful car company, I've, I'm on my third Tesla at this point. What do you do? Do you drive them into the ground? What do you do with them? Oh, they're great. What do you mean? I mean, every few years I upgrade. Oh, oh you upgrade. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Fine, okay. Yeah, no, I actually, yeah. We have no, I, I try to keep my car, you know. It's, it's more yeah no nah, three three years by the electric car and trade them out every year what's okay <laughs> yeah no nah, that's what all I the do. benefits I, of having I, an electric I, I, car I just okay hey, fine great you know okay I, mean, I got a plaid which is like the fastest oh. car in america yeah yeah i got a model x plaid we can talk plaid if you want but yep. acceleration is a thing there's there's some funny business going on in the data yeah yeah well, often with the acceleration, the car is allowed to start rolling forward before they start the clock. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, there's some sleazy. Look okay, at well, d- d- park, park the curtains the, there. Okay, fair park enough. Park the curtains. Well, uh-huh. I mean, it's scary fast. Yes. Trust me. I've had huge football players get in my car and scream when I've hit Yeah, yeah. So what you mean it's fast is it's not that it's top speed is fast, which it may acceleration. be. Acceleration. So, acceleration Yeah, it's fast. like two seconds, zero to 60. Yeah. Okay. What are your thoughts, for example, on SpaceX and uh, reusable rockets? So I – tweeted recently, uh, I won't remember it exactly because my tweets are carefully composed, so I'll mangle it, but it was something like, while we are all casting shade on Elon, of course surrounding Twitter and some of crazy things he might have said, occasionally pause, why not occasionally pause and reflect on the fact that Elon made electric cars a household topic of conversation and private access to space, something that is not only real, but tangible to the common person in the near future, in a foreseeable future. I use different words, but that's basically the point. I just said that. Yeah. Of course, the cesspool that social media is. He's still in it. He's blah, 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 blah. And, and by the way, he didn't invent electric cars. I didn't say he invented electric cars. No, okay. The people. So. But he definitely popularized. I mean, he definitely made the best electric car. Whether or not. Say, I'm going to say that. Whether or not it was the best. Because people forget that the early days of electric cars, you couldn't get a date showing up with an electric car. <laughs> They were like this big and the top speed was 40 miles an hour. They were like souped up golf carts. He said, I want to make an, ele- an electric car sexy. And that's why he produced. And luxurious. He produced, well, first sexy, just to undo the stigma. And that was the Roadster. The, the Lotus. The, the Lotus body. Yes. The Lotus body with right. electric uh, guts. And then the Model S was the first luxury. Correct. Uh, sedan. Correct. Sedan, which and then he came- I-, I bought seven years ago and I loved. Yeah. And you need the SUV to-, to- Yep. To compete. So, so yeah, I think as a captain of industry, it's easy to jump on him for something that he might have said that you didn't like. But in doing so, you're forgetting the rest of what he has contributed. And I think part of that is a manifestation of the cancel culture. The cancel culture is, this is one thing you did, I don't like anything you did. Yep. And when did that happen? There's one thing about you I don't like, therefore I don't like everything else about you. Yeah. We're not talking about a case that doesn't exist, such as suppose Hitler actually invented a cure for cancer. What do you do? Do you use the cure for cancer? Do you, is there a statue to him? Hitler did invent some stuff. I think the Volkswagen. Yeah, the Volkswagen. Uh, Kanye claimed he invented the microphone. I'm not sure if that part's true, but I mean, Hitler had inventions. The Nazis had inventions. Yes. Where they, you know, did horrible experiments on Jews, you know what I mean? But ultimately, it created new technology that's still used today. Yeah, the Volkswagen. It is the what it is. Volkswagen. And in fact, the, it's the air-cooled variant in the, in the range of Volkswagens was so that he could conduct his military operations in Africa where there's no water. Huh. Okay. This, there was, had military, a lot of 
technology has military right. roots. So you're air cooled. You can still drive the thing in the desert. Well, I mean, okay. with space. So, so, so I know him. You know, we're not beer drinking buddies, okay. but, but you know Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We okay. know each other. Okay, I have his email. Okay, we've corresponded, um, but I don't. We're not like beer drinking buddies. So I don't want to overstate this. Um, we know each other, and uh, I just think I. Let me let me pull rank here. I am mature enough to chastise Elon for things he did that maybe he shouldn't have done, and still praise him for things that are major contributions to the society. I'm not going to cancel the entire character. Yeah. That's I. That's a. I, I'm going to say it, that's childish to do so. Do you feel that in our lifetime, space tourism yeah. is going to be a real thing? It'll be the first way we get to space. If you get space tourism down to maybe the price of two Disney vacations. <laughs> <laughs> two Disney vacations. <laughs> if you look at Disney, the family of four, Disney for four days, twice a year, that adds up. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you get it down. It, it, we know it's a completely elastic demand curve. So when it was $50 million, a certain number of billionaires went, dropped it to 20 million, that number grew, yeah. 10 million, 5 million, 1 million, it'll continue to grow. And uh, you take it down. And then if no one, if it still stays expensive, just have a lottery. I'd pay a dollar. Pay a dollar. I pay a dollar, and the, the, the lottery raises $100 million, and one person one wins. One person goes, yeah. I mean, do you, who do you think will will get there first? Do you think Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos with uh, Blue Horizons? It depends what you mean by get there. Meaning I, 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 no, I, I see what you're saying. I said yeah. that rhetorically. Yeah. It depends what you mean by get there. Um, Bezos Branson in the billionaire boys race. Well, I think Branson dropped out. Did he? Did it? Didn't uh, Virgin Galactic go out of business recently? Did okay. They I think his heart is still there, but <laughs> if, it, if he physically okay, but whoever else is in the running, okay, the billionaire boys race is a race to commercialize suborbital flights. Right. So the rocket goes up and falls back to Earth. And while it's falling back to Earth, but before it enters the atmosphere in any significant way, you have a period of time where you're weightless and the blue sky becomes dark because there's no scattered light. There's not enough atmosphere to scatter light to turn the daytime sky blue. So the daytime sky goes dark. The sun is there. Stars are there. And you're weightless. Okay. That is a completely different machine than the one that goes into Earth orbit. That's the one that Elon Musk has. Yeah, I want to go into orbit. Of I don't course. want to just go up there and, and joy ride. weightless it's, for like 30 seconds and, and, and go back joy ride. It might be, kind of it might be five or 10 minutes, right. Yeah. Okay. You want to go into orbit with the entire orbit and you can see, you get to see, um, what is it? It's a orbit once every 90 minutes. So is it 18 sunrises? I do the math on that. You have multiple sunrises in your 24-hour day. I think that's the holy grail of a tourism or uh, tourism to the moon. Mm. Why not? Put, yeah. put, put an amusement park on the moon. Wow. And imagine the rides there. That'd be really fun. Oh, that that with, would be wild. With lower yeah. gravity. <laughs> well, yeah, less gravity. And then I have to tell you a, a bad joke. So, uh, of course, if you had a whole city there, you'd want to live there. You'd have hotels. You'd have restaurants. Okay. You'd have to cook the food a little differently because of air pressures and things. Yeah. So the restaurants would be fine. But one thing is for sure. They'll have no atmosphere. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I mean, the oh, real geeky joke. Okay, geek joke. Forgive me. All it's good. a geek dad joke. Okay. All good. Well, I mean, the true purpose of SpaceX, from what I understand, is actually the colonization of Mars. Do you expect that? That's to a happen? goal of his. No, no, he wants to. He wants to terraform it terraform, and colonize. Yeah. That's a goal. Okay. Uh, I don't mind that as a goal if it gets you other achievements en route. But but I think that's less realistic. All right, because how long does it take to get to Mars? Like three years or something like that? No, no, it takes uh, on a – if you wait yeah, for the, the configuration, time. you wait. It's about nine months around Nine there. months. Okay, And then you got to hang out there until the Earth and Mars realign. So it's a, a round yeah, in trip. In order is, to go back. A yeah. round trip is three to five years. Is okay, okay. Trip. That's where that number came that's from. That's where they came from. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So do you think that will actually happen? Terraforming of Mars – 
humans going to Mars and hanging out there for months at a I time. I don't see us creating a colony in the foreseeable future, but I don't see why we wouldn't create a habitat module. Mm. But if you do that, then you get off your spacecraft in a spacesuit, you walk into the habitat module where it's pressurized and you have oxygen, you take off your spacesuit. So now you're living on Earth on Mars. You're not actually living on Mars. You're in a habitat module yeah. where there's plants growing, where yeah. you have farm animals, where you have whatever, all right? To truly live on Mars is to terraform it. And then it's and Earth. It's made, and now, you, just, oxygen now you can just Mars. step off the spaceship huh. and breathe the air the way Columbus did stepping off of the, the, the Santa Maria, okay? He goes to the new world. He can breathe the air. He can yeah. repair his ship because trees in the new world are made of wood, just like the ones he built his ship out of. There are other human beings there to greet him and to show him what foods to eat. So none of that is on Mars. So it's not analogizable okay. to the great era of, ex of explorers. Based on your science knowledge, is it actually hypothetically, scientifically possible to terraform Mars and create oxygen on Mars where you could step off your spaceship and go hang out in Mars? I see no law of physics that prevents it. But what I will say is we are still running away from hurricanes, okay? <laughs> buy toilet paper, buy water, run! We still, when the volcano erupts, we lose our cities. There's stuff happening on Earth yeah. that we do not control. We are victims of Earth being Earth. Now you want to completely control what's going on on another planet? Before that happens, it, that's a level of geoengineering yeah. that we do not yet have on Earth. And the, right. pe the people who are saying... Who is saying, oh, why does Elon want to go to Mars? Does he know something about Earth? Is we better to trash Earth and he's, he won't be the one living on this other planet? Here's the point. You worried about trashing Earth? Really? Really? Okay. The environment, the thing. And then you want to go to another planet after you terraform it? If you have the power of geoengineering to terraform another planet, then you have the power of geoengineering to terraform Earth back into Earth. Mm. So the whole premise of that film, Interstellar, where there's a blight on the crops, yeah. everyone is starving, let's go find another planet and ship a billion people there. Whatever effort that takes, it seems to me, it's you should be able to fix the genome of your yeah. corn crop. Right. Really? <laughs> really? It's all there under your microscope? Okay. So I, I don't want to... It would make excellent science fiction mm -hmm. to do so, but they're practical matters about what it is you would end up discovering first in order to enable something else to happen. Well, uh, Elon also said that uh, AI will hit uh, people like an asteroid and sees it as a real serious threat to humankind. To so you, you disagreed with this. Well, I mean, he thinks a lot about technology. Right. I think a lot about computing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't present myself as an AI expert, though I've probably written 50,000 lines of code in my life, uh, b dating from the mid-70s, early to mid-70s. That's how old I am. So I am I think a lot about computers. I remember what people said about intelligence in computers, artificial intelligence. You know, the, the Turing test was a big metric at the time. We've blown so far past the Turing test, yet people still, the Turing test for those who might not remember, is if you can have a conversation with an interface and not know that it's a computer giving you those responses, then that counts as artificial intelligence. Okay? Aha. That's basically okay. the foundation of a Turing test. What has happened is- And today that doesn't really apply. Of course, because we've blown past it. Yeah, we've blown past we've it. We've blown- yeah. Past it, right. okay? I a version of that Turing test back in the seventies. There was a program called LISA, which intelligently would interact with the, your your syntax. You would say, LISA, I'm not feeling too well today. Why aren't you? Why do you think you're not feeling well today? Mm -hmm. It would just revert it back, and, and it would be a it would be a session with a a, 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 psychi a, a psychiatrist, right? Um, well, I just came from home, and well. Tell me about your mother. <laughs> and it was, it would just ask. It knew enough to piece these bits together. Yeah. And so we have blown way past it. And then, you know, uh, computers do all of our calcu calculating. When it 
computer did my long division instead of me. I didn't freak out and say, oh my gosh, it's going to take over the world. That's the end of the world. I didn't go running for the hills. I said, let's use it. Now I don't have to do long division. Right. And every problem we confronted in astrophysics, we were taking computers to the limit of their abilities. And as computer power improved, we let it do it and we would then take it to another level. Hmm. And if there's some task that I can program a computer to do, you damn straight I'm going to have the p computer do it. So now computers show language abilities. And now somehow everyone's freaking out because okay. it can do language when it's been doing math brilliantly for the past hundred years, no, 70 years. Yeah. So it's reached, AI's reached into zones where people didn't think computers would ever reach. Right. And they're freaking out. Yeah. I'm saying if, if chat GBT can write, then let it write the stuff that nobody else wants to write. Let it write everything that was never signed by the person who wrote it. Like mm. travel brochures, <laughs> like <laughs> instruction manuals. <laughs> right. Give it the stuff that we didn't want to do in the first place. And I, I, the fact, why we fear that. By the way, any technology we should fear. Yes, of course. When computers could calculate gravitational forces, they're the nefarious people, what basically every country would now calculate trajectories for missiles mm -hmm. using computers. Yeah. That is AI with the capacity to be highly destructive. I, I'll call it AI because it was stuff humans couldn't do at the time. It was superhuman that it can calculate missile trajectories around the world for intercontinental ballistic missiles. So the, this would be AI possibly ending civilization. Well, yeah. I don't People know say you, we have uh, smart computers and the internet, and you know what? You know what AI will never know. What's that? Something that's not on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you watched the show uh, The Mandalorian. No, the, no, I just Plus. know bits and pieces of it. Right. There was a an episode this season where you had the society on this planet where robots pretty much ran everything. And then like a bug got into certain robots where they started to like kill people and so forth. And, you know, the Mandalorians were brought in to try to fix it. And the first thing was like, well, let's just turn off the robots. And the guy was like, our society will fall apart. No one works anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone just, just, you know, is into philosophy and governments. And, you know, they would rather have the occasional murder than to deal with them actually doing all the work that the robots have been doing. So we, we left ourselves susceptible. Susceptible. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Like if you if you literally if they said that, you know, the Internet's killing people, we need to shut down the whole Internet. I don't think we'd be shutting down. No, you know? So you could they're, they're having trouble shutting down TikTok. You know what I'm saying? So you compartmentalize it. You know, you don't give the the coffee maker control over your car. You don't give your car control over missile systems. Yes. Right? I that we would have to redouble our understanding and in, in implementation of firewalls. Well, listen, I, I drive a Tesla and every day I use auto drive. Certain people would never do that. They're terrified of it. But for me, I don't even like cars that don't have auto drive. Well, I feel it's too much work to do all the driving myself. I spend some I spend some time in the book referencing that we're not emotionally and intellectually ready for self-driving cars. I'll tell you why. Right now we lose thirty five thousand last year was forty thousand people to automobile accidents in the United States alone. That's an entire Baseball stadiums worth of people every year. Yeah. Okay. Almost as many as people who died, service men and women who died in Vietnam every year. And we just accept that. All right. Self driving cars can drop that, let's say initially from 35,000 to 5,000. Mm -hmm. Well, how did the 5,000 die? Oh, bugs in the software where there was driving towards a sunset, it thought it was a traffic light, it moved forward and it mowed over people. So auto driving killed 6,000 people. Well, how about the, the 29,000 other people that didn't die? Is yeah. anyone writing an article yeah, yeah. about I'm, 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 the I'm, undead people, the non-dead people? I'm right there. But what am I, so, on the wrong so we have yeah. to get through that is my point. Yeah. And one thing is for sure, you investigate every one of those, as the FAA does with plane accidents. And then you say, oh, here's why that happened. Let's recode it, upload the new software, and all cars in the world will now not have that, uh, repeat that accident. Yep. 
This is the, the and that number will systematically go to zero. Yep. I don't know that we have the 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 temerity. Well, that's not the right word. The, if we have the the patience to go through the active killing of people with software bugs, relative to the <laughs> <laughs> the passive killing of people, because you're you you got in your car at two o one in the morning after you exited the bar, or you tried texting. By the way, self driving cars could also text and drive <laughs> at the same time. No danger there. <laughs> they could totally multitask if they needed to. UFOs. You had a very interesting quote when it comes to UFOs. You said, you're telling me there's an alien in front of your airplane and the best you could do is a fuzzy monochromatic tic-tac and it's in our atmosphere, it's there and the plane can see it, really? Not only that, but there's 6 billion smartphones in the world, last time I checked, and each phone can take high-resolution photographs and video. If a kitten jumps from the table to the back of the couch and falls, it goes viral. Do you think if anyone has a video of an alien, it wouldn't go viral? There's millions of people airborne at any, at, at any time. You have satellite photos. Still, no aliens, no nothing. Um... We have crowdsourced an alien invasion, crowdsourced. And in the 60s and 70s, there was a psychologist named John Mack who specialized in interviewing people who said they were abducted. That's where you get the whole anal probe thing. He finds these accounts were so repeatable that all out of a sample size, if you multiplied it by the full population of the country, there must be a million people who experienced it. Millions of Millions. people abducted, correct. Abducted. Nowadays, you can stream what your phone sees. If an alien is taking you into a flying saucer, you can stream that. In the air of the smartphone, there's no such video. That's right. So basically, you're saying that all these UFO sightings, none of them are actual extraterrestrial alien objects. That's not what I'm saying. I'm okay. saying if you want to declare that, the evidence is insufficient to convince someone who's an authentic skeptic. Uh, you want it to be an alien, that'd be extraordinary if it's an alien, but it's just, it's a light doing things in the sky that you can't explain. That's why where the U comes from in UFO or the the rebranded I don't know why they rebranded it the UAP yeah unidentified who are they fooling they they mean UFOs unidentified aerial phenomenon please mm -hmm. government who do you think you're talking to so they're all talking about the same phenomenon stuff in the sky that you can't explain just because you can't explain it doesn't mean they're visiting space aliens okay just let's be clear about this okay. Just because a European person will not accept or believe that Africans can build pyramids in an amazing civilization doesn't mean aliens help them. And I'm a big fan of the film Stargate. Yeah. But those are aliens that built it. I love the film, but the at film the end too. of the day, yeah. it's, you know, it's people in denial of something that's in front of them. So I, and they want to credit aliens. So I just need better evidence, that's all. I want the aliens here. I worry that they already have visited, but they landed like during Comic-Con or something. And it was, hey, great costume. And then they just got unnoticed. But I, if, in fact, if that did happen, they'd go back to their planet and say, they're just like us. <laughs> well, I remember when you were on Joe Rogan. So the Rogan, nerds might save the, save the world. When you were on Joe Rogan, you said that you don't think that aliens would find us interesting enough to go through all the trouble to visit us and so forth. And I remember after, you know, he talked about it, he kind of, you know, spoke down on you in a way and he just disagreed with you. He goes, of course, aliens would find us interesting. We find uh, algae interesting and, you know. No, algae experts find algae inter interesting. Right. <laughs> it's that subset yeah. of the botanists, right. uh, that subset of the scientists who find algae interesting. Everybody finds aliens interesting, okay? Uh, so it's a matter of scale. But uh, who am I to know what would or wouldn't interest an alien? What I would say is, what kind of an ego must you have to think that a more advanced species, vastly more advanced than we are, yeah. as it would have to be if it traveled here, we haven't left low Earth orbit in 50 years. What kind of an ego does it require to believe that aliens would cross the galaxy just to observe us in a very shy way. Okay, like crop circles and all this, that happened when no one was looking. Yeah, crop no circles I've never believed. Yeah. Okay, 
All right, but okay. Or let's, when we visit Earth, let's only go to the restricted airspace where the Navy flies and then, and let's make ourselves fuzzy. One of my favorite jokes of, of um, what's the guy's name? It'll come to me in a minute. Comedian. He said, you know what terrifies me most? Mitch Hedberg. Is not whether Bigfoot exists. It's whether Bigfoot is actually fuzzy. <laughs> I don't know, actually out of focus. <laughs> so you get this landscape and out of focus Bigfoot comes towards you. That would be terrifying. Mm. Completely terrifying. Out of focus Bigfoot. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Because, I mean, recently there was a news article that the uh, a Pentagon official claims that recent UFO sightings could be alien probes. Who knows? I mean, everyone likes to cite pedigree of someone who's speaking. Yeah. Are you human? That's all that matters. Okay, you're susceptible to bias, you're susceptible to belief systems, you're yeah. susceptible to all manner of things, and pedigreed people speaking does not constitute evidence. It's, it's evidence of a kind, but not the kind that you would need to justify, not the kind, of all the kinds of evidence that would exist for things. If you say, you know, I came from my mother's house this morning, I have no reason to doubt that. I'm not going to say, are you sure? Let me test that. Because there's nothing you said that either violates known laws of physics or would be completely mind-blowingly extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So the more mind-blowingly extraordinary something is, the higher is the test for evidence in support of it. And as that ascends, if all you can do for me is hand me pedigreed people telling you the same thing, the fact that they have pedigree does not add to the evidence base of what it is they're describing. Yeah, I think uh, they asked Obama, I think maybe last year, you know, whether he was shown like alien corpses or, you know, crashed UFOs and so forth. And he said no. He said he actually asked about it and <laughs> wanted to see everything. And they basically said, we don't have nothing. So, I mean, listen, I would love if it was like Independence Day where, you know, they got a whole bunch of bodies. Welcome to, yeah, <laughs> Welcome to Earth. Exactly. And of course, Area 51, I, I joke about this, but you know it's true. All you need is the janitor to take a picture yeah. of the stockpiled aliens and stream that, okay? The janitor would lose his job immediately, mm -hmm. but five minutes later would be the most famous, richest janitor there ever was. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, th there's a website called UFO Sightings Daily. I go, love it. Love you it. Love it. Yeah. Just recently, I guess uh, they got some images from the, the Mars uh, rover and they claim that this right here is a crashed alien ship, the circle right here in the horizon. This is uh, further proof that there's a, you know, further proof that Mars. there's a software called Photoshop. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> in the era of Photoshop, we need. Better than photographs, even. You have to do better than that. Just because of the risk of... Yeah, uh, so, Photoshop, so, AI, Yeah, AI all of that. Art, deep like, deep fakes. Yeah. So what you need... What would be great if you just produce the alien. Get, bring it to the town square. Yeah. That, that would solve everything. Uh, and I'm not saying these aren't aliens. I'm saying you just haven't convinced me yet. But why do you care about me? Just keep chasing them down. Go for it. But I, it, I'm so unconvinced by the evidence put forward that I have too many other important things I want to do in my life than devote any extra time to this subject. But the people who are, they grab and find an alien, bring it forward, they'll be famous and rich. You know, you're one of the few scientists that's actually known. And, you know, if you ask kids, if they've heard of you, a certain percentage would know who you are. But there are so many vastly accomplished scientists over the years that have invented so many important things that nobody's ever heard of. And I remember I saw a documentary about uh, Dean Kamen, the one who uh, he invented the, uh, the Segway. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, yeah. A lot of stuff, uh, Coca-Cola freestyle, all that type of stuff. And when he said something, he said something that was very interesting to me. He said that, you ask a bunch of kids who LeBron James is and everybody knows, but you'll bring up the guy who invented the cell phone and no one's ever heard of him. And in the society, a man who can get a ball 
through a hole with a slightly better percentage than all the other players on that team is worshiped like a god, whereas the person that's actually created technology that's changed everyone's lives is totally unknown. Does that bother you to a certain degree? It used to, but it doesn't any longer. How so? I, of course, I'm known not because of the science I've done. I'm known because I'm delivering the science to a public that has an appetite for it. And I've invested some energy to study that appetite so that when I feed, when I present the, the, the buffet, I know what to put there and how to position it to maximize your interest. So I've already thought about that. All right. I, I think you're asking the wrong question. Okay. It's not, oh my gosh, we all know who LeBron James is, but we don't know who invented the cell phone. Not that that was one person, but let's use that as a, as a, as a proxy. Uh, I would care if you didn't know what a cell phone was. The person who invented USB and someone else who invented JPEG, two things that are like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I would be upset if you didn't know what either of those were more than if you didn't know who invented it. So, yeah, it's, it's we should know who invented it. I don't want to say that we shouldn't. But if there's technology that's changing our lives and you don't know about the technology, to me, that's a more severe oversight hmm. than not knowing than not knowing who invented it. You say the work is more important than the actual person behind the work. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. And uh, as an educator, my educator's version of that is: if I teach you something, I don't want you to go away and say, "I know this is true because Tyson told me." I will have only succeeded if you have taken ownership of that knowledge or that wisdom, or that insight. And then someone says, well, why do you know this? Oh, because of this and that, and here's why. And this plugs in that way, and this cross-pollinates there, and here's the explanation. Wow, that's cool. And I get forgotten. I don't need to be remembered for any of that. Mm. I, people said, how do you want to be remembered? I don't need to be remembered. I just want the world to be a little better off for me having lived in it than not. And why wouldn't we all want to do that? The privilege of being alive is extraordinary because most uh, – Richard Dawkins waxes poetic on this. The number of people who could exist in the combinations of the human genome vastly exceeds the number of people who have ever been born or likely will ever be born. In other words, most people who could ever exist will never exist. Hmm. So we are alive – against, as individuals, against stupendous odds. We won the lottery. We will die for having had the privilege of living. Mm. Because most people who could exist will never even be born. Wow. it's a great way of looking at it. That's how I... Think about life. Yeah. Well, you and I both went to college. I have a computer science degree from UC Berkeley. You've got undergraduate, master's, and PhD degrees. But when you look at what's happening in the country right now, uh, college enrollment for undergrads dropped 8% from 2019 to 2022. A lot of people, especially in my field, feel like college is a scam, college is unnecessary, and so forth. I've always disagreed. I remember me and uh, Robert Kiyosaki, you know, the rich dad, poor dad, you know, guy who went to college himself. We kind of disagreed on this as well. You know, I've said, you know, over the course of your lifetime, you will make on average a million dollars more with a college degree than you will with a high school diploma. It's an extraordinary. If you're difference. just looking at the money aspect Correct. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there's an overall sentiment in this country. I don't know about other countries, but in the U.S., that you shouldn't go to college and it's a waste of your time. How do you feel when people say that? Because I disagree with that statement. And I know my life would not be what it is today if I didn't go to Berkeley and learn what I learned there, which I apply into my job. 
So the the two bits of that that needs to be separated. Okay. One of them is the debt that you will incur for having gone to college mm-hmm. if it cannot be paid outright uh, can be extraordinary if you're going to a elite private school, especially um, less so with state schools, but still you're not coming out debt free. Yes. So that has forced the, the conversation mm. to say, is the degree worth what I had to pay for it? It's a good point. So that's, that's, that's a, that also depends on the major though. Engineers aren't complaining about their college debt. Of course. Philosophy majors are. Okay. Liberal arts degree people, Generally English are. majors are. Right. Okay. So I want to separate my answer from that issue. Okay. That's a very important issue. Yes. So my answer is, as I've gotten older in life, I've come to learn that college is not for everyone. By whatever metrics we would invoke. Mm-hmm. There are people who can't focus. They're always distracted. Might even just be ADD. Is yeah. it, can it be medically tamped down or not? Can you? Are you responsible? Can you hold a schedule? Maybe that'll happen later. That's the whole point of community college. Oh my gosh! In community college, interview folks. In, it, many of them, if not most, they weren't ready for college when everyone else was going to college at age eighteen or se- age seventeen, or they had to. Somebody got pregnant, or somebody had to. They had to work, or they pay the rent, help out grandma, mom. There's some circumstances that got in the way. And then they go back to school by attending community college, get an associate's degree Mm -hmm. as a terminal degree or possibly even move on. So what a role community college is playing for people who are trying to still figuring out whether it's the right thing for them. Mm -hmm. My larger story here is, again, I went to a liberal arts college. Uh, You can't, in today's time, you can't go to college saying, I want to major in this so that I can have that job when I get out. What do you mean? Okay. Suppose suppose it's 2007. All right. When did YouTube come online? Was it around there? Uh, yeah, around 2006. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you are 17 years old and you tell your parents, Mommy, Daddy, when, I, when I'm a little bit older, I want to be a YouTube influencer. <laughs> They're going to look at you and say, go to college. What, what are you, crazy? You're talking, it's crazy talk. I don't even know what that is. Look at the ways people today can make money that did not exist five years ago. Yeah. Ten years ago. Okay. Yeah. Vlad so, TV is built on, on YouTube, essentially. Okay. So you might have built some other media thing. Given your your reach and your smarts, so but nonetheless, you are making money today from Google, yes. Who who pays your check? And there's a day when Google didn't even exist. Okay, mm-hmm. so my point is the rate at which society is shifting relative to our parents and their parents. Well, oh, join GE, and 30 years later, you retire. And you're, no, nothing lasts 30 years. Nothing. Nothing you want to bank on, at least. So take a look at the, the, the makeup of the Dow 30 industrials, okay? That gives you the, the, the Dow Jones industrial average. Yep. Go back 10 years. 15, 20, 30. It's completely changed. Oh, yeah. Okay? So, my point is, my opinion is, you don't go to college to learn anything. You go to college, no, you don't go to college, you don't go to college to learn a subject. You go to college to learn how to think. Yeah. You go to college to learn how to do research. You go to college to learn how to know the difference between what is bullshit and what isn't. Right. Okay? Then you come out a thinker, a lifelong learner. Yes. When you wrote, I wrote a paper on the Etruscans that I didn't know anything about, but I had to write it and I hated it and I did it. And now I know a little bit still about the Etruscans. That's not what mattered. Because when you're in college, you say, I'll never need to apply this. 
That's not what it's about. It's about the brain wiring so that right. when you confront a problem you've never seen before, your brain wiring goes into high action and you say, okay, we decoded this thing the other time and we figured out how to connect these bits of information together in that way. Maybe this new problem will respond to that level of analysis. Yeah. You, you want to become a problem, you want to become a thinker, a problem solver, not here's this, here's this vocational knowledge that I'll then apply. That's the problem with vocational knowledge. You can go become an air conditioning expert and then everything gets swapped out. In, in five years, you got to go back to school. But if you know how to think, you are way more useful to someone that just, than just knowing what to think. And so college, at its best, will do that for you. At its lowest level, it'll teach you a trade that'll work for the next five years. But then you got to go back and get recertified because things are changing at that pace. Oh, yeah. No, I, I agree. And, and I wouldn't trade my college experience for anything. To be 18, to go to Berkeley to suddenly have a level of freedom that you didn't have as a high school student living at home, to be surrounded by other smart people, you know what I'm saying, who are into different things. But when you go to a, a high-end university, everyone has to be smart in their own ways. You're surrounded by smart people. You learn the process of being self-motivated. You know, you don't have your parents telling you, you know, like your your schedule is suddenly your own. And it's such an incredible yeah, transition. But some people can't do that. Right. They're not ready. That, They're not right? ready yet. Right. Some right. people aren't ready yet. But, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I was ready. And, you know, it took me four and a half years to get through. And like I said, I, I remember when I moved to New York at age 29 to become a DJ, I remember always thinking I wasted my time in college. I could have started with this hip hop thing at 18 and I'd be ahead. I'd be four years, five years ahead of where I was now. You fast forward, you know, whatever, 10 years after that, Vlad TV became a successful company and it's because of what I learned at Berkeley, you know, which allows Vlad TV to be both a tech company and a content company, which none of my competitors had. By the way, don't overvalue what you learned at Berkeley versus what you would have learned at any good college. Just right. want to put that out there. I mean, right. listen, I'm proud of my school, so I mentioned it, but yeah. I'm saying at any good college, regardless of where it was, you know, and the process of completion of actually getting your degree. You know what I'm saying? Not just going there and taking a couple of classes to be able to start something and finish it to completion, which is something a lot of people just can't don't do. know. They, they can't do. It's a maturity. They, they, yeah, it's maturity. It's, it's a maturity of life. I matured a lot. I learned a lot. My, yeah. my first relationships with women were d during this time. And there was so much that I learned that when I hear people say that college is a scam, is a waste of time, it's like, well, you've never really done it. And you could say that from your point of view, but from my point of view, my life would be drastically different I think if I just started to work after high school. The history. people who say that, say that because they either hadn't gone to college or because they went to college and learned very specific things yeah. that they don't believe matters to them later on, yeah. which is what you were perhaps feeling when you started DJing. Yeah. And I still maintain that the act of learning those bits and pieces it's not the bits and pieces that ultimately matter. It's having to have gone through what it took to learn them and to write a paper on them and to compose your thoughts and to lay them to page in a way that someone else can understand them yeah. and then to be judged on it. Yeah. This is, that's life. Get over yeah. it. And let's not forget that having a degree from a university on your resume matters. It does. Especially going to a top school. Someone who went to Harvard, regardless of what they majored in, I'm going to guess they're not complaining about their, their loans at this point. I'm sure everyone that went to Harvard was able to pay back their loans fairly quickly. There's no shortage of people wanting to hire Harvard graduates. But at the end of the day, people are going to decide and people are going to make their own decisions. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for coming in. I've been a fan for a very long time. Oh, this conversation was epic. And I think a lot of people are going to learn from this. I just, I'm an educator. If that's all I can do in a day, that's a full, that's a, that's a successful day for me. Oh yeah. And millions of people are going to watch this for many years to come and they're going to be educated. Do I get to say that some fraction of everything I told you is in this, my recent book? Do Please I get do. To, do I get to say that? Yes. Let's yeah. plug the book. It's a book just from a few months ago. came let's out. Let's plug it. Starry Messenger. Starry Messenger. Cosmic <laughs> Perspectives on Civilization. Yes. And it's just what the world looks like if you come to it looking through the lens of science literacy and, and a dose of what things look like from high above. And so many things in our lives 
yield, or not yield, that's not the right word, um, are, in, are hi highlighted and, and illuminated by having these kinds of perspectives on it. And their chapter is called Color and Race. That's where I wrote about Mm -hmm. You're racist black anthropologists. <laughs> There's a whole you, – you want more on that list of what they, that anthropologist would have written? There it is. Yep. A whole chapter on, on – uh, so color and race, uh, gender and identity, um, law and order, uh, uh, life and death. It's where I talk about the idea that we are lucky to be alive. So celebrate that. Don't squander it. So all that's in there. And I, yep. It's an offering – it's it's my life's wisdom compiled into one place. And we'll have a link uh, to that book in the description. So okay. for everyone who's watching it, they could click on it. They could Good. get either the, the audio book version, which is the way I, I consume books, or yeah, the audio version, uh, or even the print version. I, I did narrate the audio book. Oh, you did it yourself? Yes, I did. Great. And I, I used my planetarium voice. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And uh, I found out how to measure the length of an audio book. It's uh, how many mornings in... LA traffic. <laughs> Does it take to listen to the book? <laughs> so you can get it done in four mornings on four LA mornings. traffic. That's LA what traffic. it is. On the 405. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's a pleasure. You got Until it. next time. Dude. All right. Peace. Thanks.